eight in the morning to our to our multi-agent behavior workshop. This is the third annual multi-agent behavior workshop at CVPR. And just to give a little bit of background and motivation on this, um, multi-agent behavior is something that occurs across a huge array of domains. I personally am a neuroscientist. I'm interested in the brains of interacting animals and how the brain controls social behavior. But while I was a postdoc at Caltech and working on these things, I started talking to people like Jen and Marcus and Pietro's Peronas, Pietro Peronas lab who are doing the same kind of problems, thinking about interacting agents in a context of things like computer vision and self-driving cars and robotics. And we came to realize that there are a lot of different fields that all have to think about how different agents interact with each other and how they collectively shape their behavior. And the goal of this workshop was to kind of put all of these different fields together in one place and look for common ground between topics. So there are a bunch of different goals that could drive the study of multi-agent behavior. So I'll start with a uh, simple system that folks are hopefully familiar with, and I will close my email so that it doesn't make terrible noises in the background. One second. There you go. So our model system of Pac-Man has a bunch of different kinds of multi-agent behavior that we might want to study. So one of the goals that you'll often see in the natural sciences is just a goal of description. So given how agents are moving around in the world and how they're bumping into each other and reacting to each other, can we come up with an, a quantitative and a high detail narrative of the actions that the agents are performing? Another common goal, both in neurosciences and in engineering and practical applications like self-driving cars is forecasting. So given the states of the agents and the recent history of the agents, what is it that they're going to do next? Can you predict where a pedestrian is going to walk, whether they're going to cross into the road, what another car is going to do? All of these are very essential for engineering applications of the study of multi-agent behavior. And then there's causality, trying to infer what agents in what signals in an agent's environment shape their behavior. What is it that an agent is attending to? What is it that they're going to be responding to? Can we try to infer these causal drivers of behavior by looking at what an agent is doing? And then again, this is more from the neuroscience perspective. What can we infer about the underlying motivational state of the agent uh, based on their actions? Can we infer that an agent is being an aggressor versus being subordinate? Can we infer that a player in a computer game is cheating versus playing fairly based on their, based on their observed behavior? We might also be interested in generation. So given an environment in a new setting that we haven't seen an agent act in before, what can we say about how the agent would behave in that setting? Can we make predictions about its behavior? Can we come up with rules for how an agent interacts with the world around it? And then there's also the question of interaction. What is it that agents are communicating with each other? What are the signals that they pass to each other to shape their behaviors? What roles do they take? Or from an engineering application, what signals should they be communicating with each other to shape their behavior? So all of these are potential goals of the study of multi-agent behavior that might span different fields in biology and engineering and robotics. And then there are also computational challenges that are faced by these, these different applications, these different domains of the study of multi-agent behavior. One is, and questions for people attending this workshop, one of these is generalization. So are there common tools that we find in the different domains that we're going to hear about today, different methods that people are using, or common methods that people are using to make sense of the behavior of interacting agents in different applications? Are there also common tools across different applications within a domain? If you're focused on different components of robotics or of biology, are there common tools that are just generally going to be useful for making sense of behavior? Another question is accuracy and how do you find the right level of description of a behavior? Is it always going to be the same level of description or do different end goals have different ways of framing behavior that would be more useful for them? Is it more helpful to be able to predict what an agent is going to be doing long-term and its general motivational state? Or do you really want precise fine-grained temporal pre prediction of the actions in the next couple of seconds? So this question of accuracy and of timescales is something that shows up across different domains. And one of the things to think about in these talks today is 
the, the approaches that different groups take to this question of accuracy and description of agent behavior. Another emerging goal in machine learning that also is appearing in multi-agent behavior is this question of interpretability. Can we create models of agent behavior that aren't just a black box for predicting future actions, but that help us learn something about how a behavior was generated? Is there a trade-off between getting very accurate predictions of an agent's behavior and as observers and scientists being able to conclude something about the sensory cues, the environmental cues that drive that behavior? And more generally, how do we encode our domain expert knowledge into our models of behavior? The talks that you're going to see today are all focusing on different specific applications where you're studying interacting agents. And so one thing to think about in the talks today is how this domain expert knowledge is being used to achieve better performance in the predicting and forecasting of multi-agent behavior. And one thing I invite you to think about is what general things make prediction and forecasting and analysis of multi-agent behavior in a particular domain better? What are the things that allow us to go beyond just generic time series modeling to capturing something about our, our underlying knowledge of a particular domain? Uh, one of the topics that emerged when we were picking speakers for this year's workshop was populations of large groups of agents interacting with each other, be they uh, salmon outside of Vancouver swimming up to spawn, or uh, swarms of honeybees, or swarms of interacting robots, or self-driving cars. Uh, several of the speakers this year will be talking about large populations of agents collectively making decisions about how to behave. And so we're interested in seeing what these different fields, these different applications of multi-agent behavior analysis are bringing to this question of large-scale collective behavior. So before we get into the talks, just a couple organizational things. I am here as a member of the advisory committee, but the people who really did all of the hard work for getting this workshop organized are Jen Sun and Marcus Marx, who will be hosting the first and second half of the talks today. Um, so you'll be, you'll be hearing more from them as the speakers are introduced in a little bit. Uh, this is a workshop that kind of spawned at Caltech and has run for a couple of years now and has really grown and evolved with the input of different folks from the group, from the community. Another aspect of this workshop that I'd like to highlight is that we've historically with each CVPR workshop run a multi-agent behavior competition, typically building on data sets from neuroscience. Uh, the past two competitions happened earlier in the year. We have a third competition that's going to be launching later this summer, as soon as we finish getting the data sets formatted which is a supervised behavior analysis challenge focusing on laboratory mice. So we've reached out to, this is again building on the fact that I come from neuroscience and we work very closely with the neuroscience community. Neuroscientists are very interested in automating the analysis of animal behavior and studying the interaction of animals. And laboratory mice are a very common test case for this. Uh, and there's a, a shortage of benchmark data sets in the field for the study of multi-agent behavior, which we've, we've been trying to address. So starting later this summer, we're going to be releasing a data set of about 200 hours of video of socially interacting mice compiled from about 16 neuroscience labs. All of these are top-down videos of mice, usually pairs, sometimes quadruplets, in an open arena running around and freely interacting with each other. Uh, this data set could be used for all sorts of things, could, could be used for forecasting, be used for learning a generative model of mouse behavior, identifying what sensory cues mice pick up on to make behavioral decisions when they're interacting with other mice. For the, for the challenge itself, we're releasing uh, human manual frame-by-frame -frame annotations of 44 unique behaviors of experimental interest, things like investigation, aggression, reproductive behavior, grooming and digging yeah. behavior, and the goal of the competition is just to see how good a job we can do at reproducing these human-defined actions of interest with uh, features extracted from the postures of these interacting mice. So that competition is associated with this workshop and will be launching later this summer. And I encourage folks who are interested to, to take a look at it and keep their eyes out for the launch of the competition. So for the workshop today, it's a half-day workshop running until talks until around 11.30, and then we'll have a poster session, I think, downstairs in the basement. 
after, after the main talks are over. We have six invited speakers, a mix of in-person and virtual speakers you'll be hearing from today. We will have a first group of three speakers introduced by Jen Sun. These are uh, Sabine Howart, Georgia Gyoksari, and Tim Longroff, who will be talking about their studies of multi-agent behaviors in different biological applications, I think. And after those three talks, we're going to have a 15 minute break from 9.45 to 10 a.m. Once we get back from the break, we have three more talks that'll be introduced by Marcus, Siu Tang, Wei Xian, and Rami Alvor. We'll be talking about multi-agent behavior in different applications, including self-driving cars. So we'll have these three talks. Following those talks at 11.30, we're going to have just a general discussion and social, some time to ask questions and talk about common themes that have emerged across the different talks here. Uh, just something very informal. We have some cookies just hang out and talk about behavior with us. And then we'll mosey down to the multi-agent behavior poster session, which starts at noon posters, 189 to 198. I think a couple of our presenters had visa issues and won't be here, but we'll try to figure things out. And uh, we look forward to talking with you all today and to having some exciting discussions about behavior in different settings. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Jen, who's going to introduce our first cohort of speakers. And I'll stop sharing my screen so that, uh, Sabine? Hi. Let's see, I can bring this guy. Okay, you should be able to share your screen. Great, can I, I can jump in then, hi everyone. Hello. Um, oh, hi Sabine, I'll quickly introduce you. Okay, sure, sounds good. Okay, I'm definitely excited to be here to introduce our first speaker, uh, Sabine Howard. Uh, she is an associate professor of sperm engineering at the University of Bristol in the UK. Her research focuses on engineering swarms across many different scales from trillions of nanoparticles for cancer treatment to thousands of robots. She is pro profoundly cross-disciplinary and works between engineering mathematics, the Bristol Robotics Laboratory, and life sciences. And her work has been featured in a variety of different media, such as the BBC, CNN, The Guardian, Economist, etc. And without further ado, I'll hand it off to you, Sabine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here, even if it's just uh, virtual for me today. So I wanted to bring you on a journey, engineering swarms across scales, but mostly we'll be looking at the larger scales today and thinking about how we can get these swarms out of the lab into the hands of people who may use them. And as we saw before, I have a, a source of inspiration, like many swarm engineers, which is this flock of birds that can do beautiful, complex dances in the sky. And there's many features that are useful for real world applications. For example, if you keep adding birds to the flock, it can continue to fly so it can scale to very large numbers. If a bird falls to the ground, the whole flock doesn't crash so they're robust to individual failure. And together they can do more than the sum of their parts. For example, avoiding predators. And what's fascinating is that this, this emergent behavior, the stance in the sky is not the result of a leader telling every bird what to do, but the result of each one of these birds reacting to the local environment around them. And there's many examples of self-organization around us in nature, whether it's these flocks of birds or ants as they make a trail to your picnic table or bees as they make decisions about their next nest sites or indeed our ability to grow fully functioning human beings from just a couple cells. So the challenge for us as swarm engineers is very often we know what collective behavior we want to achieve. We want to have collective motion, trail formation, decision-making, morphogenesis, like in the process of embryogenesis. But we don't know how to design the individual agents and their local interactions. And that's really the puzzles that we need to solve as swarm engineers. Is it working? I think it's working. I'm just trying to get rid of a, a pop-up on my screen that does not want oh, to go away. Well, let me okay. try this. <laughs> as long as they can hear me. I don't mind. Great. So how do we how do we go about cracking that puzzle? 
Um, well, there's really two strategies that we use. One is to use bioinspiration. So we talk to experts who study birds and ants and bees and cells, and we take the rules that biologists have discovered and we adapt them, simplify them, and then put them on artificial systems like robots. So that's the bio-inspired route. Or sometimes we have no rules for a desired swarm behavior we would like to achieve. And in those situations, we tend to do exploration. So that could be a PAP, a PhD student guessing the rules and running simulations to see what the emergent behavior looks like. It could be many people guessing the rules, so a form of crowdsourcing. Or what we do increasingly is use machine learning. In our case, it's a form of artificial evolution to automatically discover individuals and their programs that give rise to desired swarm behavior. So what's nice with the bioinspiration is when you have the rules, you can go ahead and put them on robots. So this is me filming 10 of our flying robots over in Switzerland in Daria Floriano's lab, and we could throw them in the air. And you see these GPS trajectories, it's very messy, but over time it converges to a circular topology, which is actually what we predicted would be the swarm behavior, the flocking behavior of our flying robots. So that's one example from the birds. You can look at ant-based rules, and this is a very simplified version where we have a hundred little robots called kilobots. Oh, I'm I'm blurred. <laughs> Hopefully you can see these. So these are little kilobots. We have a thousand of them here in the Bristol Robotics Lab based on Radhika Nackpel and Mike Rubenstein's design over at Harvard. And these little robots can communicate within 10 centimeters using infrared. They have an LED so we can see what state they're in. And they have two vibrating motors which control their motion. But really we like to use random motion so that we don't need to calibrate them. And that scales to large numbers. So here you can see them moving randomly finding an object in the environment and a trail grows back from that second robot in the environment back to the source. And these trails for anyone who's interested are a form of diffusion limited aggregation. The snowflake algorithm, we're basically growing a snowflake arm uh, with some modifications. And this is nice, it finds the nearest object in the environment. It also avoids obstacles if you put an obstacle in the way. And here what you're looking at is decision-making inspired from honeybees. So here we have 400 of these real kilobot robots. Here they're deciding between blue and red, blue and red here, you can see it randomly starts. And in about four minutes, it converges to blue. And this is inspired from how honeybees uh, communicate about their next nest sites. Essentially robots are advertising their preference, blue or red, blue is the higher quality one. And so they advertise that for longer and the red robots or then actually any robot just adopts the last opinion they've heard. And because of this discrepancy in how long you advertise opinions, you break symmetry and you get consensus formation. And here you're looking at 350 robots inspired from work by, by James's Sharp team who's, who looks at how embryogenesis can grow into functional shapes like the digits of your hand. And here 350 of our robots are pretending to be little cells and they're exchanging virtual chemicals called morphogens. And these morphogens react on board each robot and they diffuse throughout the swarm. It's what we call a reaction diffusion network. And Alan Turing had described these reaction diffusion networks as a mechanism to create spots or stripes on animals. And you can see these little spots emerge on the stripe on the swarm. And this drives the growth of these little limbed protrusions and because it's all self-organized, you can chop the limbs and they regrow. You can also split the swarm and it self-heals. And in this whole process, all these reaction diffusion um, processes continue. So the spots move, the shape grows in different ways. So it looks very organic and perhaps a little bit messy. So we have all these ways of doing bio-inspired tools. And as I mentioned, sometimes we don't have the the rules given by biologists to create swarm behaviors, especially in artificially designed swarms. And so we also use another technique, as I mentioned, which is exploration. So here, what you're looking at is a swarm of, of robots that are about uh, hockey puck size. They're called X pucks uh, based on hockey pucks. And these robots have each been given a GPU. And on this GPU, they're running artificial evolution to automatically design their own controller so that together they can push the frisbee from the middle of the arena to one side of the arena. 
And it takes about 15 minutes in real time for these robots to learn how to push the Frisbee. You can see they're getting better and better at it, starting from scratch where they're a bit clumsy here and controller set zero and one to getting faster over time. And what's nice here is this requires no external computation. All the computation is on board and every robot is running this evolutionary approach to come up with its own controller. And they share the best controllers. You have an island model. So there's some mixing of what controllers emerge and that's where we get coordination. And as we mentioned uh, before, it's nice if we can actually peer into these black boxes and understand what it is the robots have discovered is a useful set of rules for swarming. So what we like to evolve nowadays, we used to evolve neural controllers. Now we evolve behavior trees, behavior trees coming from the gaming industry. And the advantage of these behavior trees is as an output, we can read the tree, we can color code our simulations, and can, we can reason about why this controller that the robot has adopted is useful in this overall score performance that we're looking to achieve. I am not presenting this today, but, but just the discussion before made me think of another piece of work that we're doing, which is to look at videos of swarms and try to extract the behavior tree of the agents within that video. So that's something I'd love to speak to you about if, you, if you'd like to have more information further on. So where we are now with swarm research, I feel in robotics is that we know how to make large numbers of simple robots like the kilobots. We know how to make smaller numbers of more sophisticated robots. And we know how to design controllers, whether they're bio-inspired or designed using automatic tools like machine learning. And so I think we're ready to, to start thinking about where we put these swarms that are outside of the lab. How do we make swarms for people? And so one thing that we've started to do is ask people where they would like to see swarm technology. Before COVID, we designed a little escape room uh, before when we, you know, we were still allowed to lock people into rooms. And it took about 30 to 40 minutes for people to break out of this escape room, learning about swarm technology as they went through the puzzles. And we asked them where they thought swarm technology would be useful. So there's a number of, of useful ones for society, some of them that are seen as more risky, some that we in our research world consider like, like farming, pollination, construction, search and rescue, cleaning the ocean, massage, I hadn't thought of that one. So it's sometimes interesting to ask the public where they see a use for your technology. But we also spend some time um, then asking users who might use these technologies in the future where they thought swarms might be needed. We spoke to users in logistics, would they use robots in their warehouse, in their food bank? We spoke to users who do bridge inspection and we spoke to firefighters. This is them parked in front of the lab coming for one of our use case studies. And what was encouraging throughout all these discussions is first, uh, they didn't think it was nuts. They didn't even bring up science fiction. They really thought that if we found the right task, that would be useful for them because usually these were tasks with an unmet need. And we also discovered there's areas where they didn't really want the swarm to be, be doing the job. For example, the firefighters, we had this little robot fire extinguishing ball that you'd throw in a fire and go, Psh, and it would extinguish a little corner of the fire. And we thought the firefighters would think that was amazing, but actually speaking to them, they said, no, we're the firefighters, right? That's our job, but we need information. We need these robots to be able to outline where to move in the building. So, so really trying to tease out where there's the art of the profession that people feel like they need to protect and where our, our tools can augment the capabilities uh, in certain some of these businesses and industries is something that was really, really fun to tease out. And in particular, we got the ex excited by the area of interlogistics and this unmet need. If you think of robots for logistics, you probably think of Amazon, uh, with many, many robots in their warehouses. You might think of Ocado if you're based in the UK, which is a UK grocery system. And in those systems, there's a lot of infrastructure. The robots are built for purpose for those environments. There's a lot of R&D probably and a lot of money that's put within those systems, which is an absolutely valid approach. But what about these other messy real world environments? What about in small retail? What about a food bank? What about a refugee camp? What about reconfigurable manufacturing? Or an SME, a shoe shop, any place where actually they would make use of the robots if they could be used out of the box. And so we've got it excited about the idea of swarms as out of the box solutions. Why? Because they don't require central infrastructure. They don't require a good understanding of the of 
of the global plan. They don't require a leader. Instead, they require a good understanding of the local world around them. And this is really when, where I need the CVPR community. So part of my talk is going to be a, uh, a cry for help for you to also help us understand how the robots can perceive and interact with the world around them. So here's an example of how I think the out of the box robot swarm might look like. And it's just a thought experiment. So if you consider a cloakroom, let's say that at CVPR, there's a cloakroom that's, that's operated by robots. You could set this up in two ways. You could have a centralized cloakroom. So you arrive, you map the cloakroom environment, you put a central computer there, People arrive with their jackets or their suitcase to the central computer, and the central computer says, robot, one, two, three, follow this exact trajectory, pick up the jacket, follow this exact trajectory, put it in this location, store it in the database. This requires global communication, it requires a map of the environment, it requires a database that's constantly up to date, and it requires planning of what all these robots are doing in real time. If you do this in a swarmy, in a distributed way, the way this cloakroom would operate is you would arrive and put some tape on the floor, you would take your robot out of the box, and then the robots would basically be moving around in this cloakroom environment. Users would arrive with their Bluetooth app and would say, hey, I've got a jacket, and the nearest robot would come to them. You'd put your jacket on that robot, and the robot would deposit the box with the jacket anywhere in that cloakroom environment. So there really is no centralized control, no database, no map, no infrastructure needed for the setup. And at the end of the day, the user arrives with their app and says, has anyone seen my jacket? And there's enough robots in that environment that look around and, and see the jacket and bring it back to the user. So in, in this context, there is no database. Actually, the user could walk in, pick up their jacket. It wouldn't matter. It's a much more organic, interactive way of setting up an environment. And because we think this has potential to be a reality, we've been building a new test bed for intralogistics uh, called the DOTS for Distributed Organization and Transport System in collaboration with Toshiba. So these robots are about vacuum cleaner size, they have a lifter, but they're much more sophisticated than many of the robot swarms that you've seen up until now. They have a 16 laser time of flight sensor, six hours of battery. They're very fast. They're driven by drone motors. So they're, they can go quite fast, although the videos that you'll see are them at lower speed. Um, they have four cameras. They have, they have a bunch of CPUs, six CPUs and a GPU. And using this, we're hoping that we have the capability for the robots to understand enough of the world around them that we can start to think of these out of the box solutions. So this is an example of the arena uh, currently operating at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory. These robots are moving randomly, so it's a very simple algorithm in this case. And they're localizing using their onboard computation where the boxes are when they're nearby. They pick them up and they bring them to one side of the arena. So there's no planning that goes into this. It's just local perception of the world around them, onboard computation. And you'll see that we've added our Yuko tags to our environment to simplify the task for us. And this is really something where we need help. How do these robots perceive the local world around them that we can expand them into more real world environments? Uh, because we're using local perception, we're also understanding how to do this better and faster. So this is a new, new algorithm that Simon's been designing who built the robots called Frappe. And the aim is to be able to localize. These are Yuko tags and do all the processing on board the Raspberry Pi Zero processing units that are connected to the individual cameras. And you can see some of the steps here where we go from detecting edges and corners to filtering, to localizing and getting the, the positioning of these are Yuko tags in our environment. And that in turn allows the robots to localize using them. And Frappe is about five times faster than the off-the-shelf are Yuko detection libraries. And because it's faster, that means that if we wanted to dock, let's say these robots dock under a box, we could dock from much further away than if we were using the off-the-shelf li library. So we're learning that it's really important to figure out how to perceive our environment in an efficient way. And you don't need to understand everything. That's another aspect. Um, we can get away with quite simple behaviors and good performance, random walks, if you have enough robots, actually get you a good performance. But we do realize that people care about our robots looking a little less crazy. And so we're also spending some time having robots build maps of the boxes in the world around them. And here what you're looking is work on Gaussian belief propagation, where each robot here in colored circles 
is making predictions about where they think the boxes are in the environment. So you can see this pink box would be where the pink robot predicts the box to be. And so we're learning ways which would allow our robots just using local exchange of information and local perception to go straight to that box in their cloakroom environment or whatever the warehouse application is. So that's logistics, but there's actually many other areas in which we think swarms can be can be useful for people. Here, what you're looking at is, is our team working on swarms of drones for forest fire monitoring and mitigation. And so we're designing algorithms that would allow you with around 30 drones to cover a place the size of California and monitor it for 24 hours. And the robots we're modeling this on are very large aircrafts built by wheel tracers. They're called ultras and they can travel 1,000 kilometers with a 500 kilo payload. What you're seeing here is our practice robot, so it's a smaller robot, but this allows us to think about, in collaboration with firefighters, you know, firefighters are used to piloting drones. They manually pilot one drone, but how do you make a firefighter a swarm operator? And so Georges has been building a whole interface that allows him to very easily monitor the swarm receive feedback from the swarm, control the swarm, and optimize its behavior in real time through this digital twin technology. We're also thinking about ways in which we can make swarms more social. So here what you're looking at is a swarm of tiles. They're screens on wheels, and we use these robot swarms to interact with in social gatherings with humans. Here they're helping users at a mall in Bristol um, give their opinion about what they can do to fight climate change, and once they've selected their opinion, like eat more salad, that opinion is then a physical avatar on a robot that lives on that other people can see that can interact with other opinions. And that's been a really useful gateway of engaging people. And we've continued this work asking people what they might do to fight climate change by turning these robots into small smart post-it notes where you can enter your idea, for example, take the bus more often and putting that down, the robots automatically cluster. Again, you can see there's some image um, vision analysis here for the robots to be able to understand where they are. And then based on what the message is on their post-it note, they can self-aggregate into clusters so that people can navigate this world of ideas um, in the environment. You can see this robot's a little hesitant. <laughs> um, and if you go to the different clusters, you'll see that they the themes, the themes at least make sense. And this is Marihan uh, who's designed the robots. And we're also trying to help biologists, so go full circle. So these are trials that we've been doing this summer, uh, trying to look at the gills of Baskin sharks because they, we think that they might be really useful um, architectures to capture microplastics because they're very good at capturing microplactins. And so these are just initial trials where we're designing three robots, so a very small swarm. But the plan is, and, and we have preliminary results, is to do image analysis of the fins because when they feed, these backing sharks are at the surface. And so the plan is to be able to automatically visualize those fins so that three robots can put themselves around the shark and we can image some of the fluid dynamics and try to understand the biology of how it is that these basking sharks can capture the little microplanktons. And then another way in which I think swarms can be useful for humans is at the micro and the nano scale. So I haven't covered this in depth, but I'd love to talk to you about it if anyone has questions. If you think about nano treatments for cancer, an injection of nanoparticles will have 10 to the power 13 nanoparticles. And depending on how you design those nanoparticles, their size, their shape, their charge, what you put on their surface, their material, how they release drugs in the environment, those 10 to the power 13 particles are going to behave as a collective in very different ways. And so we've built computational frameworks that allow us to grow virtual tumors, cut out little tumor slices, and then we use artificial evolution to design nanoparticles so that we can optimize the treatment of these digital, of these digital tumors. And at the more micro scale, we look at skin and thinking about skin as a swarm and how can you drive processes like wound healing. And so here what you're looking at is a device called the Dome for Dynamic Optical Microenvironment. And this is entirely open. You can download the plans. It costs around $1,000 or so to make. And here, what you're looking at is a scratch on a, on, a, on, a, on a slide with cells. And so we're interested in seeing if using light, we can drive the wound healing process, maybe even adapt that to the type of wound over time. This is still early days, but we now have a mechanism where we can change the light source. We can zap these cells in an individual way and try to drive the collective behavior of these microsystems. 
So in short, we're excited about, about swarms in the real world. And there's this thought that we just need to make it happen. But actually, the, we need to do more than that. We need to think about how to make these systems trustworthy to deploy. And that's an ongoing effort. We've only just scratched the surface on how you make safe swarms. How do you consider the ethical, the legal aspects, the accountability, the individual behaviors and their safety, but also the emergent properties of the swarm? And how do you make the system easy to interact with in terms of can humans understand swarms? Can they monitor them? Can they control them? Can we verify them? Can we specify them? Can we do fault monitoring and mitigation? And are some of our swarm properties of robustness, scalability, and adaptability good things when making trustworthy swarms? Or does it just make the world a bit of a messier place? And so we've started just trying little bits of this puzzle. For example, here, what you're looking at is a cloakroom scenario. And we're asking users to tension the things they care about to make the system trustworthy. For example, maybe someone cares about making a very safe cloakroom because users are gonna walk in this cloakroom environment. Or maybe they care about making a very fast cloakroom environment because it's in a locked environment and there's no issues of safety. But these things are usually not compatible. And so we use an evolutionary approach um, called Map Elites, which allows us to illuminate different types of solutions that can allow compromises in these different characteristics so that when the user tensions these different things it cares about in terms of trustworthiness, it provides a variety of solutions that the operator can look at and select from. And we're also looking at how these agents, just using their local metrics, can detect whether they're faulty. This robot here, which has a pentagon around it, has detected that something's funny in, in how it's perceiving its local environment. It doesn't look like it encounters as many neighbors. Something is not a bit off, and it's detected that it's faulty. And we're currently working on mitigating many of these faults. And something beautiful that's arisen is many, many faults don't need mitigation. Sometimes mitigation makes things worse. And so we're learning what faults actually need mitigation, or if we can embrace the swarminess of it and live with some of these failures. So we're currently at the, we're, we're, because we've been speaking a lot to industry in this process of making swarms trustworthy, we've also started to realize that it's not just about KPIs. It's not just if you're talking to a warehouse operator about performance cost, speed, and energy, right? Is there something about the swarm performance indicators that, that tell you the system is usable out of the box, that it's robust, that it's scalable, that it's adaptable, that it doesn't require infrastructure set up because there's no global leadership? Is there something about trust performance indicators where maybe you could put metrics or measures to these systems to say how trustworthy it is or not in different aspects that users might care about? So we're, we're trying to operationalize a lot of the things that we've been exploring from a research side to, to value them, really, when you go out into the real world and present them to your industrial collaborators. And this is, this is my new thought experiment that I'd like to explore. Um, and this has to do with city scale logistics. I'd really like to see if a swarm of our robots could do something like power a local economy and the exchange of goods. And this, this comes from, I don't know where you are, but here we have little scooters at the corner of every street that people can just hop on and scoot to wherever they need to go. And it's a, it's a, it's a common good. And, and so I wonder if we had little pillars with robots hidden away at every corner street. And if you have leftover food, you could give it to your neighbor. If you had jeans you wanted to swap, you could call one of these robots and it would bring the jeans to your neighbor. If you want to buy croissant, it would go and fetch your croissant. Maybe there's a communal warehouse where you can put goods in, take goods out that aren't necessarily the ones that you put in. So think about how we power um, this local circular economy use, using something like out of the box robots that people could just add at the corner of their streets. So let's make them trustworthy. Let's try to get them in the real world. And my, my request for help from all of you is how do we actually make them understand that local world around them that would make them work in these city scale logistics or, or beyond. So this work is very cross-disciplinary and collaborative. This is a picture from, from just last Friday from our, our Swarm Farm Day. Um, we work across disciplines and it's, it's uh, funded by a number of very cross-disciplinary sources as well. So thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm happy to take, uh, I don't know if we're doing questions or, or not. Yes, I think we are doing questions. And let me. Would you like to MC? Oh, you have a question. You want to come walk on these dogs, right? Or I can relay your question to you. Yeah. 
either of the mic or yeah either way works <laughs> I just had a really basic question and need to understand kind of how these smart robots work. And for example, the robots that are playing this game, what was the task? What did what did the robots know prior? Like what would they know that say prior and what did they learn? Um, which 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 robots? Huh? So I just missed the part about which robot. Um, I just like want to get a better sense of like what is the what do these robots know ahead of time and what is part of their interaction? Um, I don't mm -hmm. know, or is that is that like different depending on all like which environment the application is? Right. So it, it depends. It depends on which which swarm we're talking about. But usually, when we're developing the rules for the robots, we will have an idea of what type of environment they're going to live in, and what types of interaction modalities are available are available to them. And then we have to build rule sets that that are based on that. Um, so, for example, with with the dots arena, we will know in that current context that there are boxes, those are Yuko tags, and that's what we built our controller on. The the challenge for us is really how do you design the controller? So the robots. Um, and that's why we use artificial evolution in the sense that that allows us to sample lots of different controllers and see if the emergent behavior gets a good score. And based on that score, we get designed better and better controllers to get the desired emergent behavior. So there's no, it's it's it depends what you what priors you're thinking of. But the robots, once they're set loose, once they have their controller, all they're doing is using those rule sets and reacting to the local environment around them, unless they're doing evolution on board, in which case they have to do a little bit more than that. I don't know if this answers your question, but the, yeah. The so basic... Are there certain priors that you kind of bake into the robots before the evolution starts? Like, so when, right, so when we're evolving the system, so when we're evolving a solution, what we'll encode is the environment in which we want that solution to work. We'll evolve the sensing modality. So we'll, we'll know that the robot has X number of sensors and can control its motors. And what we're trying to design is the, the program for that. So connect those sensors to those, those motor commands. And we will give it a score for how well it's performing a swarm behavior. And that's all we need to evolve the system. And then it automatically finds the right combination of controls to be able to achieve that swarm behavior. So we, we, don't, we don't give it any depending on how, it depends, it depends. Sometimes we can build little behavioral blocks that are a bit more advanced, but we, we can, um, yeah, we give it the environment, the sensing and the control modality, the motor modalities and how, how to connect those. And then it, it does all the connections for us. Thanks. Uh, uh, sure, yeah. Um, let me uh, ask the Zoom question first and then we'll get, is that okay? Um, so a question that happened on Zoom is, what are some important properties of swarms you've identified? Are there principles which various algorithms seek to address? So the, the ones that we care about are scalability, adaptability, and robustness. So we've currently put metrics on those to see how scalable your system, how, how adaptable it is, and how robust. Because I think that's what makes it interesting in, in, in the real world. If you change the environment, if you change the obstacles that it encounters, if you change the numbers of robots, the things people would do if they're adding robots to a real world system, um, we're, we're trying to put numbers to that to see so that we can engineer for those features. Uh, thanks. Oh, and there's one uh, another question from the in-person audience. Hi, um, this was a really great talk for you, this was, uh, um, I appreciate how all of this is informed by uh, or at least inspired uh, biologically. Um, and if, if we're thinking biologically, humans are probably the most sophisticated swarming kind of agents and collectors. Um, and with that, humans have language and that enables us to uh, kind of transcend the egocentric view and be able to have individual agents informed by external factors. Uh, so while you don't have a uh, kind of controlling body orchestrating activity, um, you do still have some sort of broadcast knowledge that is um, external to the individual agents that informs the agents' actions. Have you considered um, incorporating something like that in um, any of these scenarios? So, so very good point. Two, two things. One is, is I, I do see these swarms as operating in a similar way 
to human societies to a certain extent. For example, that cloakroom, the way we would operate in a cloakroom is we'd all look around, we'd shout across the room, we'd be, we know, we'd say, have you seen number two, three, four jacket? And, and so we, we self-organize in that may, manner across many different scales. So, so I think it's, it's much more in, interactive and, and organic in how we'd interface with human societies than maybe more controlled systems where you expect it always to do this very perfect choreographed thing. Um, in terms of how you get information beyond what's happening at a local level, uh, we have a project called the Hive Mind, looking at how you offload computation and sensing and memory to a cloud, but all in a distributed way, in the sense that the robots put information up there, they request information, they request some enough to understand how they should operate in a local way using, using tasks that are local to them. So we, we realize that the sweet spot is probably in between the, some centralized information and some local information, but we're trying to see how we can do this, but while still getting the adaptability, robustness and scalability because the process is driven by the distributed robots rather than the central control. Okay, great, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's the end of the question session. Um, thank you so much, Sabine, for joining us. Everyone. Um, thanks. Uh, I'll introduce the next speaker, which I can see, Georgia. <laughs> um, we'll switch out your, your laptop right, for the presentation. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. And I'll uh, we'll do the introduction using that mic, maybe. Go for it. That's Sorry. Easier. Okay. So while Georgia is setting up, I will. Okay. Okay. When you say a little weird, what do you mean? It's like ninety percent of it was cut off on the CPU. Oh, good. No, it's good. Thank you. Okay. Good. Um. Great. Um. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh. For having me. So. I don't work in multi-agent behavior, so my talk is going to be very different than the rest of the talks that you probably see today, um, but I do work in perception, and while I understand that a lot of the problems in multi-agent multi behavior have to do with uh, interactions of agents uh, with each other, I do think that a big part of how we humans and possibly other other agents interact and, and go about their, their actions in the world have to do with perception and how they perceive the world. And another aspect of multi-agent behavior that I'm very excited about is this collaborative learning of how can we actually use multi-agent perception and interaction to go back and improve our basic computer vision systems like recognition. So I've been working predominantly on recognition. I care about taking images and understanding what they contain. And I'm sure that you've seen a lot of these applications uh, and a lot of these tasks in this conference. This has largely been driven by data sets like ImageNet, which has been a large data set of many in scenes of the, around the world. And we've been trying to build computer vision systems that can take ImageNet images and recognize what they contain for years now. 
Um, I've also been very interested in more precise recognition and localization, namely of objects. So taking an image, any complicated image, and I want to understand what are the objects uh, it contains, where, what they are, where they are, and what, is, what their shape is. Um, but a big, a big fundamental flaw of a lot of these methods and a lot of uh, computer vision work as of today is the fact that it's treating the world as 2D grid. So it's assuming that all of our world, this complex, beautiful world that we have, is actually nothing else but 2D pixels um, arranged in a 2D grid. Um, and that is actually not uh, very useful um, for building a lot of applications and applications that we want to exist in, in 3D. And one such, one such set of applications can be seen here. If you want to build embodied embodiment, physical AI robotics, agents and multi-agents, we want to have 3D perception. If you want to build autonomous vehicles, we need 3D perception. If you want to build other imaging devices, we also want 3D perception. So the, the, the question now is, how can we actually build any computer vision systems that will take any image of the world and understand exactly what that image contains? And this is what I want to talk about today, how to move perception from from 2D to 3D, the ability to understand objects in 3D space, where now your output all of a sudden does not live in this comfortable 2D grid, but you are, um, but it lives in 3D. And here you see a, an output of this model and also uh, a top-down view of the predictions, because once again, exactly the outputs live in 3D space. And I know that you're not 3D people, so you might not care about the nitty gritty details, but I do want to show you a little bit what the prior work is on this on this field, what our solution is, so that maybe we can start thinking about how to integrate some of these systems to your own research that is around multi-agent behavior. So a lot of prior work on 3D understanding has been um, focused on two different axes and has been studied in two different perspectives. So the first one is the urban world where you want to uh, build any agents uh, like self-driving cars where the point of view comes directly from the driver. So it's only the the, the, oh, the view of the of the agent as the drive. Um, this has this is very popular line of work with a lot of papers, workshop tutorials because everyone wants to build self-driving cars. However, the solutions that are proposed, they're very far from general purpose. Actually, a lot of these works assume that your urban world is actually um, very specifically given from the point of view of the driver. Uh, but the urban world is not just that. There's that you can actually take this, all of these are images of the urban scene that you can uh, that are not from the point of view of the driver. Next up is the indoor world where uh, not, where, where you, we are capturing indoor scenes. Uh, and here, a lot of the work has been done on very simplistic scenes, kind of like student offices and apartments with one chair, one table, uh, which are far less complex than what other indoor scenes can be, such as uh, fancy bars, restaurants, churches, all those environments where any human can exist in. And obviously, there is also a very big flaw with studying this problem under two, these two distinct perspectives, because there are many occasions where you actually want the intersection of these two worlds. You have here's an urban scene, so you have it's a street. There is a bicycle. And there is a sofa, uh, which is an indoor object. And any there isn't actually a single computer vision system that can take this image and understand it whatsoever. So this is what I wanted to cover today: how we can that can operate on all the domains for all objects, uh, no matter what they are. So this is towards general 3D object detection in the wild. Again, I know that you're probably not 3D people, so you don't care about maybe developing techniques like that, but you're urge you to consider using these techniques for your own research as solutions to 3D perception are very important for multi for, for studying multiple agents. So the challenge here is going to be that we want to take any images of the world, no matter what objects they contain, how many objects they contain, what their layout is, and be able to detect that. And how we're going to do this, I'm going to briefly describe today. Um, and, and this is in this work that's called um, Omni 3D. They'll be presented on Wednesday. So 
I'm sure that many of you are familiar with, uh, with 2D object detection, which is one of the most popular problems in computer vision, where the task is to take an image and to try to detect all the objects, where every object is described by a category label, um, an XY center, um, a width and height, all of them in pixel space. Now in 3D object detection, the problem is a little different, uh, but also kind of the same. Uh, so again, you wanna take an image, you wanna detect all the objects, and now you wanna describe every object with its category label, its 3D center, uh, its width, height, and length, its pose, and all of these outputs now exist in metric space. So you're no longer on the comfortable pixel grid, you're now on this metric space um, where every object has metric, a metric, a distance from the camera, a size in meters, and also a pose. Um, in order to go about this and to, to build a general purpose solution, we took inspiration from 2D and saw what people did there in, in 2D recognition, where the biggest uh, impact for all methods and all solutions in computer vision has come from large data sets. So we have these data sets that are large, diverse, they contain many objects like Coco and Elvis, and they have driven progress in 2D recognition. Now, 3D data sets didn't quite are, are not quite there yet. They, there isn't a single 3D data set that, ha, that, that has the properties of 2D data sets. But luckily, um, since 2019, 2020, there have been a lot of 3D data sets that uh, were released by various teams in the world uh, to try to solve some of uh, various 3D problems. Not 3D perception, not recognition. They wanted to solve other problems like inverse rendering, or point cloud reconstruction, um, but we but we saw an opportunity to actually be able to repurpose these data sets to make them into 3D object detection data sets. And so this is what we did. We have, um, we, we built, uh, we repurposed uh, all of these data sets and unified them into a single data set uh, in, of uh, one, one dictionary of object types uh, in a unified coordinate system. Um, of images and 3D objects. So this data set is very is much larger than existing 3D data sets, more than 3 million object instances, more than 230,000 images of across domains and for various object types. And some statistics on Omni 3D. So here you see the frequency of, so you, so you see the categories that we have, and you also see um, the frequency of some of the objects. So once again, like all data sets that are long tail. So there's some, some objects that occur very frequently in the data set, some other objects that occur very, very rarely. Another important uh, attribute of Omni3D is the diversity in the range of the objects in depth. So you have scenes that have objects that are very far away, uh, all the way up to 200 meters, with uh, of course a lot, with majority of the objects being concentrated around 10 meters or closer. Great. Um, so this is the data set. Uh, there is a lot more analysis about the attributes of the data set in the paper. That uh, So if you want to learn more, please uh, go and read the paper. Um, so next up, we wanted to create a baseline, a baseline for Omni 3D that can detect any object in 3D space from images. And we really didn't want this method to be complicated. We actually wanted it to be very simple so that anyone without really being an expert in 3D can build on top of it and can, can extend it for their own purpose. And uh, even though we try to make it very simple on purpose, almost embarrassingly simple, we found that a very simple yet very good design uh, was able to not only get the best numbers on Omni 3D, but also beat a lot of benchmarks uh, a lot of methods on single data data set benchmarks. So this model, though it's a baseline and this is what we intended to be, turned out to be actually a very good method for across data sets and across tasks in 3D. And the most exciting perhaps uh, uh, property of, of this method, CNN, is the fact that because it was trained on such a big data set, it has learned these general purpose representations that do generalize to domains uh, far from the domains of the training set. So beyond evaluating on the test set, we see that we can also take images of anywhere in the world and use it to understand and detect our objects in 3D space. So I don't, I'm not gonna cover some of the nitty gritty details behind, um, behind this data set, this method. Oh. Uh, and instead I'm just gonna go, um, 
I want to show you perhaps some results and maybe we can also have some discussion on how you can, how, how to use methods like this for your own research. Um, I, let me see, let me see, let me see. So perhaps I'm just going to cover a little bit of, of what the architecture looks like and then move to, to results. So um, Uber CNN is, uh, belongs to the family of FASTER RCNN. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. It's a family of object detection systems. Uh, so you have an input image. Uh, then you, uh, a backbone uh, takes that image as an input and embeds it into a feature map. This can be anything. If this can be a ResNet a, or any other CNN, it can be a transformer, it can be uh, any model you like. Um, and then after the feature map, we have a region proposal network. This is a network that tries to predict roughly where objects are in the image. Uh, it tries to basically tries to say, here's my image. I don't know how many objects there are, but uh, because it's not given to me as input, but I'm try trying to guess that here is, are some rough locations where the objects where objects might be. So at this point, it's a class agnostic network. Uh, and then follow the, the task specific head. So we have a 2D head where for every detection, we're trying to classify what object it is and also more precise to localize it. And then we have a cube head that is trying to predict the 3D box for every detected object, which is then also compared to its ground truth. Um, and so we try and now train this data, this model on our um, on Omni 3D, and I want to show you what it can do. So uh, here I want to show you some images and some detections from uh, from the from the approach. So you see here on the left the input image. On the in the middle you see the projected uh, 3D uh, detections on the image, and on the far right you see a top-down view of the detections so that you can get an understanding, first of all, of the layout of the detections, but also of the metric scale. So every tile here that you see is one meter across one meter. So that gives you an, uh, an understanding of how, how big the objects are. Because remember, our predictions are a metric scale. And here's another scene, which is, I think, a kitchen. Um, an urban scene, uh, as the model can actually tackle both. Um, but more interestingly, we we can take any image from the internet and actually apply this this model too, like this living room right here and another scene. We also um, applied this method on. Um, on for tracking on from AR headsets. So what you see here is a video of someone walking around um, uh, their apartment wearing this uh, kind of nerdy looking headset. This is a project from Project Aria team at Facebook. So this is a headset that has um, uh, three cameras, one black and uh, two black and white cameras and one RGB camera. It has IMUs so that you can actually get camera poses. It also has microphones, which we're not using here. But uh, you could you could potentially use them. There's actually seven microphones or uh, microphones along the, the glasses and other fantastic hardware um, features that make this a very exciting headset for all sorts of captures and potentially also multi-agent behavior analysis methods. Um, and now the now the real test of any computer vision system is can will this actually be applied on a video when you've trained it on static images? Will this also tackle the visual domain of a capture like an AR headset? You see that the scene kind of has different orientations that are training data. Our head, when we walk around, actually moves in ways that when we take static images, it actually doesn't. So there's definitely a big gap in the visual domain. And we were quite nicely surprised um, that this method that was trained on such a big data set was actually able to tackle some, some of the scenes quite well. Of course, there is a lot of limitations uh, when you have complete, when you have scenes that are kind of, that are not common, especially object configurations that are not common. For example, this car in, on top of or being carried by a truck, which is not a very common thing for the model to have seen. Like, okay, what do you mean? There's a car inside? The, you know, what what is that? Um, it actually struggles in trying to make a prediction. It's like it it knows that they're, they're close, but it also knows that they can't possibly be overlapping, so um, it, it's confused overall and actually outputs a wrong prediction. 
Um, and here's maybe where I'd like to maybe insert my opinion about how to also see multi-agent interactions as a way to improve recognition systems. So in 3D, we, if, you want, if we want to perceive, we humans are very smart. So we know that we can see a lot of things because we've built this human visual system that has had mil millions of years to evolve into a, a fantastic way of perceiving the world. Uh, but it's but the question is how are we going to do this with computer vision systems? And I do think that multi-agent understanding is an aspect of this problem that has not been studied enough. So how can we actually build cooperative systems, perception systems that can improve single computer vision performance, but also lead to much better perception abilities when combined in a multi-agent frame? And I do feel that some of these limitations might get lifted when we once we move to such solutions. So I want to give this to you um, as a food for thought, and also potentially try to engage with some of your work in case some of these solutions are useful for you. Um, and I want to summarize here in my talk. So um, 3D recognition is actually hard. It's a new problem statement where there is long tails in both categories and also depth range. Um, Moving away from single domains is important for better representations. So even if you care for, to apply your model to a single domain, you should likely be considering learning on multiple domains in order to lead to general purpose solutions. Um, oops, what happened? Okay, oh, I'm sorry, disconnected. Okay, you can see, okay, it's back. Um, and the problem of 3D is largely unsolved and underexplored. And I do think there is a lot of room for creative solutions in this space going beyond what was done or with the success story and 2D recognition and what other paths to success were for other computer vision systems. I think that this is a space where creative solutions will actually um, dominate the, sp the space. And with that, I want to thank you and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks for the good talk. Um, I'm wondering how you are, uh, or some sort of our CNN, um, I'm wondering how you are able to infer depth from them, or is it simply that you're just learning from um, the base? Uh, it's a learning approach. So we do learn, for, the model learns to predict depth. Um, let me go back to, I, I skipped a little few of the details of the model, but um, so the model actually right here, when it's making this prediction, one of the things that it's predicting is the depth of the object. Okay, so in, in order for this to um, represent the depth of an object, it needs to have seen that object at a specific depth, um, or it needs to have a representative data set such that it is able to um, get that seen. Right, so, so exactly, so well, it, so this is where the magic of learning comes in. So uh, you don't assume that you've seen all the, all, all the so your predictions can deviate from what you've seen in the training data, which exactly comes back to building general representations that allow it to make any predictions, no matter how different they are from the, um, the training set. But yes, having a very, a very comprehensive, a very inclusive data set that contains all possible Object layouts and depths will definitely help in making better predictions. Thanks. Yeah. I have two, two questions. Um, one is uh, if you have, because I study like newspapers, and if you have like um, training data in it that looks at birds or animals in general, or if it's mostly I think, like human scenes. Um, yeah, so this is this is mostly human scenes. Uh, we haven't gone into solutions for uh, forests or animals, uh, which I think is very interesting and potentially a very good sort of application for methods like this. Uh, we we probably said like objects, like human made objects. And then the next thing is just like like when I've been trying to get three D data from multiple cameras, mm -hmm. to get stereo. Can you yeah so yeah so so the question here is is though the, so 
this is a great point that you're bringing up. And this is one of the big issues with 3D is how you're going to get data. What are the right, what's the right data? So all of these data that we're learning from have some, some sort of multi-view aspect to it because this is necessary to even get annotations for 3D. Um, so multi-view, light, or even depth sensors are used. Uh, and now the question is, are they going to be used? Do you want to use them during your, your input? Do, do you want this to be the input to your model? Uh, or do you want to use it to get to a data set or to get to annotations that are more accurate than it would be otherwise, which is definitely true for 3D. But then the way that you learn is kind of up to you. It's basically what do you, what requirements do your, does your system have? I am very strong believer that models should work all the way from one single image all the, and using multiple images and depth sensors, the both performance getting better. So we should have solutions for all of that range of different inputs that we assume. But for 3D, having multi views, many cameras, potentially depth sensor is important to even to get annotations. I'm sorry, sorry, there's a question Oh, I can look, I can see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. In real life de deployment, presumably the agent is moving around the world. Yes. Is there an element of training with movement? You experience um, EG video or com compositing predictions. You've experimented with and you've experimented with and has this performed worse or better than static image training. Um, so I so again, I think this comes back to the answer I gave is. A lot of the data actually that we train on is video data. So because you are there, if you look at how we acquire the 3D data that we're training with, it is someone that, that is walking around a seed and we're using this information. Uh, however, during training, we are assuming we're taking static images from these data sets to train with. The, the demo that I showed you with the tracking of the AR headset was moving. So it is a moving capture, though we are applying the model frame, frame by frame. So we're converting into a static model. My belief is that if you have a comprehensive system, then uh, deploying a frame by frame should work well enough as long as it's general and you've, um, and you've reached a good performance. But we definitely are not including motion into the system. So the model itself does not have any understanding of motion. Um, and I think that should be done. And this seems like a very important extension of this work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think the synthetic data, I am I am a pro, I'm a fan. Um, I think the biggest issue with synthetic data is whether it's going to allow you to do synthetic to real. So this is a big, the big question. Can you use synthetic data to learn something, whatever that is, and then can you actually deploy, deploy it in the real world? If you can, then of course you should be learning with synthetic data. But if you can and that limits you, then, you know, I am more skeptical. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So I can't really hear you now. Uh, let me share my screen. I hope that's uh, that's working. Is it? I guess it's working. Yep, it's thank working. You. Well, awesome. Yeah. So thank you um, for for the introduction. Uh, uh, thank you, Marcus, at all for the invitation. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to present today. Uh, so multi agent behavior in my group uh, often means looking at behavior of uh, fish 
swarms or um, honeybees. And I'm going to talk about something that's not even published yet because those reviewers at the journal were a little slow. I expected this to be already online, but uh, well, so this is pr pretty much the the hottest uh, of our work today. Although it's a little short on the on on the methods, but I guess for this crowd, uh, we <laughs> we weren't able to actually uh, you know uh, show you something uh, in, in, like that would impress you. But uh, let me try to impress you with showing you um, how bees organize their um, their space, their their colony. Uh, so this is work done by two uh, of my PhD students, David and Benjamin. Um, but I'm going to show them in, in the very end. So first, uh, why bees? Well, um, bees are great. Bees are uh, small little insects. Um, I guess the smartest insect there are. Um, they have almost a million neurons, so it's really like a huge brain. Um, and they organize in colonies of uh, varying sizes. This one here is a very small colony. It's uh, around 1,500 uh, individuals. And um, you can observe uh, them doing their thing just in that box that has two glass walls. So you can uh, use cameras to uh, observe them uh, communicate, uh, you know, uh, observe them rear their brood and and actually make honey and all these things. And and to me, a honeybee colony is like a brain um, made out of brains, of actual brains, because um, they're all interacting in quite a structured way, although it doesn't really appear that way if you look at it. Uh, the colony also has um, functional compartments like a brain does, right? So you ha we have um, regions on on your cortex relevant for vision processing and uh, you know uh, hippocampus for memory and all these things and um, very similar a honeybee colony is organizing their space um, and um, th there's there was one um, paper that I do not want to go into detail here but we uh, used the data that I showed you so tracking everyone over their entire lives, um, detecting different kinds of uh, communication behaviors, um, uh, extracting social networks from that, and then compressing these networks uh, into um, one-dimensional like um, metrics uh, for an individual. We would extract, or at, at a certain point of time, we would extract a number that represents really well the task that this B is doing without actually looking at where it is and uh, and what's doing, just just uh, with whom it interacts, and um, and that uh, we call network age. So, like biological age, it's a it's a one dimensional uh, metric, but uh, biological age always uh, you know and uh, grows um, monotonically, and uh, network age can go up and down, um, and for for the um, bees that have a low network edge, we see that they are all clustering in a certain area uh, of the nest, which is called the brood nest, which is where uh, the queen lays eggs. And then there are other bees caring for uh, those larvae. They feed them, they clean the, the cells, they feed the queen, right? So they're all pretty much clustered in there. And then as they grow older and progress into other tasks, um, they occupy a different region of the, of the nest, you know, uh, processing nectar into honey, um, in storing pollen, all these things. And then um, at some point in their life, they become foragers. So those uh, bees that actually fly out, track down resources, bring, that, bring back nectar, pollen, water, resin, all the stuff that's actually needed in the colony. And, and they are in that region that we call dance floor. And the dance floor is something that we want to talk about, that I want to talk about today. Um, which is a region uh, bees use for dancing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I uh, I would uh, assume uh, talking to a to a biology crowd, uh, everybody would know. But uh, I'm not sure about you. Mm, although I think um, um, pr probably should should be should be known to to most of you. Anyway, I want to talk about this. So, um, how does this dance floor? Uh, come about. So how is this emerging from the interactions of individuals? And um, 
And before I start that, I wanted to introduce you to what the what the bee dance actually is. Um, so if, if we look at behavior of bees, of single individual foragers, coming back from a food source, they would return to the hive and walk on this vertical surface to, to this dance floor and then perform something that's called the waggle dance. And it's called the waggle dance because, uh, I don't know, do you see my, my pointer? I yeah. hope so. Uh, so that is the dancing bee here. And I, and I slowed down that video uh, to 25%. So you can actually see what's, what's going on. So she's throwing the body from side to side, uh, walking a few steps forward, and then turning left and turning right and repeating that pattern. And the others here, uh, and one is marked, we call dance followers. Well, obviously, because they, they follow the dance, they are the ones actually trying to decode the contents of the message. And what is the content of the message? Um, if you if you have um, so this flower here at a like a, let's say sixty degrees angle from the sun, you would see the this waggle run or waggle face uh, with the body pointing in exactly sixty no not exactly but like more or less uh, sixty degrees from uh, from the direction of the gra of gravity right so this reference. Um, is changed an hour later because the sun's traveling across the sky. And then at some point, let's say we have a, an angle of like 30 degrees and um, the dancing bee would uh, like uh, adapt to this change. So it took a, quite a while to for humans to figure that out. So the content of the dance is um, this direction that you, you'll find a food source at that distance. The distance by the way, is encoded in the duration of this of this waggle phase. Well, this was known uh, already for like 70, 80 years or so. Um, and the cool thing now is since we, we have computer vision, we can decode that angle uh, just by looking at the, or extracting the, the angle, it, uh, the, the bee waggles and measuring how long it waggles. So we can put a dot on the map, um, you know, knowing the exact time of day and the location on the globe, uh, we know exactly the, the direction of the sun and we can decode that and put a, put, a, put a dot here. So that's cool. But now let's come back to the question of, um, you know, how does this dance for emerge? Um, the dances are all performed in that same area the foragers actually uh, um, are present, right? So it's not that the that those bees that uh, are potentially becoming dancers or potentially becoming dance followers are uh, you know walking somewhere else to dance and and follow dances. Obviously, they they always always stay in the same area. Now, my question today would be, how is this dance performed, and can we identify a structure within it? And I realize this isn't uh, like a classical pattern recognition problem, like we would like learn something uh, uh, given a data set. This is basically looking at at the data uh, in a in a pretty uh, manual kind of way, uh, but the data obviously was was produced, and we can talk about that later uh, using like a long pipeline of, of different steps um, of processing image data to well, higher level uh, data. Okay, so to assess that question, we first trained bees to two different um, food sources that we just put there: it's sugar water uh, in a dish. We carry bees there, let them drink. Uh, they will drink, fly back, and then perform a dance. And um, we have two feeders uh, at 200 or so meters uh, distance uh, from, from, a, from a lab. Uh, and in the lab, we have all the recording equipment, cameras, lights, and all these uh, things. So um, what happens when you have these, these two feeders set up? Well, you already see uh, looking at the... Uh, positions of the dancer um, that dancers um, advertising that one food source cluster more in the in the upper part uh, of the dance floor and dancers uh, advertising the other food source kind of um, um, yeah uh, or uh, organize themselves such that they are in the bottom of the dance floor and that's that's curious and it was uh, or you know, anecdotically described in, in in some in some papers, but nobody actually uh, looked at it. 
and nobody actually had that kind of data um, that we could, um, yeah, um, study whether that is actually a signal or is it just noise. And this is uh, pretty significant. And we uh, sifted through uh, more than 100,000 waggle runs. So one of those things, those wagging parts. Huh? Okay, so that's interesting. And the question is, okay, do dancers or future dancers run into the comb or the, the hive to the future dance spot and then start dancing? Or does this, this difference between the two uh, dance distributions, um, you know, gradually um, grow? And so we will, we are looking at um, all the positions of the of the um, of the of the bees are uh, um, from feeder. Sorry, from group one, and all the position positions of the dancers of uh, the group two, and also we're looking at the distance between those two groups. And we see that they start off pretty similar. Uh, and while within the group, they stay uh, more or less uh, at the same distance um, and also variance, um, like they started, between groups, the distance kind of uh, starts uh, or it uh, grows uh, continuously, even almost doubling uh, where it started off. So that's interesting. Um, so, but where does it, so where do they actually move, right? So distance growing could mean pretty much anything, but where and is there, is there, is there, is there a pattern that we can see? Oh, sorry. So what we did is um, we looked for each like bin here um, over like, uh, like a grid over, the, over this uh, comb surface. Um, what is the distribution of waggle run orientations? And each of these vectors now uh, gives you the average. Yeah. So basically each of these bins has a, has a distribution, but we were simplifying that. And we already see that this is a almost perfect uh, explosion pattern. That means if you, if you see dances in a certain part of the, of the hive, they always, on average, um, advertise directions um, that point away from the center of the dance floor. And to confirm that finding, uh, we took uh, like another route of, analyst, of analysis. We looked at all the dances, irrespective of where they were, and, and bin them by their orientation. And um, then plotted their median position, right? So for, for all the dances, irrespective of where they were, pointing to zero degrees, the average, sorry, the median position was shifted rightwards, yeah? And that pattern kind of uh, persisted over all different directions. So that was interesting. And to quantify, that effect that over time they would drift outside, right? So from, from the center on average, the center of the dance floor, they would drift outside. And so how could we quantify that? Well, we just, well, let me just minimize that window here. Uh -huh. um, so we, we looked at um, um, the displacement vector from a waggle to the next waggle run and um, took the dot product uh, with the average waggle direction, right? So over all these, these waggle runs here, um, we take the average, have that gray big uh, uh, arrow, and then for every displacement vector, we take the dot product. So if we have a, like a drift in the direction of the waggle, we get positive values. And if we have like, a, uh, if we go backwards, we have negative values. And so, uh, that was the result here, and we confirm, aha, uh -huh, there's almost a millimeter. That, that's not much, right? So it's like um, a ten, less than 10% of the body length um, of an individual. But we do have a positive drift. So over time, we gradually move. And this is like, I mean, um, this is hundreds of thousands of waggles. So this is highly significant. This isn't an artifact of our measurement. This is actually evolved in the brain of uh, of the bees and must have some advantage. And I'm gonna talk about that um, in the following slides. Okay, 
So what about um, the, the follower, the dance follower bees? Do they also drift? I mean, it would, you know, it would be intuitive because they kind of follow the dance. If the dancer drifts, well, then the dance follower has to drift too. And it actually does, they actually do so. So here we only looked at uh, bees that followed two different dances. Um, and also them, so they start off before the dance to uh, you know, almost indistinguishably, be, indistinguishably, whatever that word is, be uh, on, this, on the same spot. And then over time, they gradually move with the drifting dancer outwards. Um, such that after the dance, they, they are separated. And that's very interesting because now we can think of, okay, what does this tell us about the next um, waggle dance this dance follower will follow? They don't follow one dance and fly out. They usually take more samples, which kind of also makes sense from the, uh, from the information, um, uh, from, from a information theoretical perspective. Um, so if we look at all the dance followers um, and their decisions, which dance to follow, we see that, this the, this, that the distribution of dancers also corresponds to a decision boundary where all the um, bees north of this boundary would follow predom predominantly the dancers pointing to uh, the respective feeder and vice versa. So that's cool. And um, that is due to the fact that dance followers are usually lazy. So we looked at um, that, uh, right? So a dance follower, when um, at the point in time when a dance is actually occurring, that animal has two, two choices. Uh, one is I follow that dance or, or B, I do not follow the dance. And for, for both of these cases, we, we looked at, uh, the distribution of um, um, how, how many times that happened over the distance to that dance. And we see that um, closed dances are, are followed or the, or the other way around, the dances that are followed are typically closer, okay? But so there are dances that, that are close, like these ones here, they're not followed, but like the, the relative proportion uh, also normalized by the general availability of dances uh, points to the fact that if there's a dance close by, you follow that. Yeah? And now taking these things together that I said before, um, dance, dance followers drift in the respective direction. Um, we also see then that um, the dance that is closer is then from the same feeder, yeah? So by just a very small tweak, which is the, this little drift, less than one millimeter per, per waggle uh, run, um, this little tweak allows um, the dancers to drag the dance followers into a certain region where they are more likely to sample the the uh, the same information from a from a different dancer, and that's actually the the whole story that I have for you here. Um, and let me summarize and uh, I give you my conclusion. So we we produced um, actually uh, more than that. So uh, I think four data sets over four seasons with uh, more than a hundred thousand waggle phases that we detected automatically decoded automatically. And from, from these, uh, we found, or we, we see that dancers and dance followers drift outward. So from the center of the dance floor into the direction of the, of the signal. Um, um, and this is just due to that one little tweak in their movement program and their uh, dance program. Um, and this results in a spatial sorting process. The dance floor is, is basically a map of, um, of food sources, right? And um, it's, it's continuous. So if I sample a nearby dance, 
even if it's not the same uh, location in the world, it's a, it's a similar and close by location. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> and this simple step improves the dance communication by providing dance followers with less conflicting information. And, um, and that is a quite simple mechanism nobody actually uh, uh, found before. But I think it's a, it's a beautiful example of um, how simple these optimizations can be and how um, uh, they lead to emergent uh, behavior or emergent um, organization uh, of space. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, I'm here now for your questions and I hope uh, that, was, that was understandable from, from non-biologists point of view. Looks like there's a, there's a question from the audience. Hi, I thank you for the last talk. I have two questions. So the first question, if I assume that there are a bunch of particles of these, then do you think that they can spatially organize because it's a more energy efficient solution in some sense? So if they would waggle at the same spot in two different phases, then they would probably bump into each other more. So that perhaps they sort out in this way to kind of on the one side of the high fence where you have to once it goes one direction on the other side, it goes to another direction. Is that how you think about this? I think um I think physical constraints are very important. Um I'm not saying that they that bees act like a gas or um, you know, like particles, they do um, intentionally go, for example, somewhere to, I don't know, get honey or food or, or do something. Um, but yeah, um, let me just go back to, to show you one uh, figure that I found also remarkable here. Um, see that, um, that, that uh, line or almost straight line of, of dots and also here, this is where I think the drift is limited by the boundaries of the of the hive, right? And so this this points to actually, you know, physical properties to to actually play a role. And we do have another um, paper coming up uh, where we looked at um, circ circadian behavior, um, and so young bees are pretty much thought to be not circadian. We see that they are circadian. So they have like um, sinusoidal waves of activity. And these are due to um, bumps of the circadian bees that come in, bring in activity, energy from outside and bump into these young bees. And uh, that's why we measure also activity for them. And then maybe my second question is kind of a memory question. If if a bee dances on the upper part and goes to either one, I don't know if that was the right one. Does it actually is it more likely that when it when it comes back, it goes to the upper part of the dance floor, or is it random kind of where they come back in? So are you asking whether they kind of try to actively control the audience for their dance or actively control so, so uh, is, assuming assuming one B goes out, it's in, it's influence to go to Peter one. Now it comes back from Peter one. Does it go to the area of the dance floor where it's more likely that it will be Peter one decisions versus the other one? Yeah. Um, so we we see that bees do cluster according to um, the feeders that they visited. It's unclear whether that is due to um, following dances through the mechanism that I just showed you, or whether they actually anticipate this and and organize themselves like that. Um, but I, I thought yeah, you're them. So wouldn't you know when they re-enter if it's a feeder if they went have just went to feeder one or feeder two? So yeah, yeah, we know that. Yeah, we, we have this information, and we 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 had analyzed that, and we see there's a there's a, a spatial uh, preference for uh, these kinds of locations uh, that match our expectations. So if you had been at feeder one, uh, 
in the times that you are in the hive, you kind of stay close to those places. But we haven't yet checked whether that is, I mean, um, we haven't yet checked whether that is actually always the case, even without dances. Because, mm -hmm. right? So um, the map in the hive is actually a sun centric map, right? As the reference direction is the sun. And the sun is is moving, so this this pattern moves as well, and uh, that would kind of mean that these uh, that these animals would move also in that counterclockwise order, and they they don't. I don't think so. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, that's a very cool talk. I I have a question about how the bees learn to interpret the rival dance. So humans, we can watch it and we know, oh, they're rivaling in this direction. That means that the food source is at this angle, at this distance. For a worker bee, does she first kind of build a map of the hive's environment and then uh, interpret the dance in terms of that map? Or can she just watch a dance and know zero shot what that means in terms of where to navigate? I think um, so. Um, first of all, the dance probably is, you know, genetically encoded somewhere. Um, we do see that um, a bee, in order to be able to uh, follow a dance, has to be a forger first. So they fly out, and before they fly out, um, for like actually co uh, co collecting some stuff, they do uh, orientation flights, which is. They go somewhere and then return the, uh, the same way back, which is the simplest kind of flight that they that there is. And we do think this is due to them exploring the environment, and that kind of creates, uh, for one half of the biological world, world uh, like a mental map of the environment. I think this is actually relevant or necessary to be able to dance, but like. Uh, we don't know whether that is that means that they create uh, um, neural structures that uh, would allow this this uh, translation of you know the cues that they uh, perceived in in following the dance, you know those two parameters, and then put them on a map, or whether that is because it's a prerequisite for actually flying out and finding something. Um, but what what we know is that um, if they have attended dances before and followed with more experienced foragers, their precision in reading the uh, and translating that uh, to, the, to a flight is better. So there is some social learning involved. And that was a science paper just a couple of months ago. Thank you, very cool. Are there, if there's no other questions, we're actually at our break time. Um, Tim, I just wanna thank you again for joining us and answering the questions. Um, and we actually now have a 15 minute break session. So resuming at 10. Um, so see Thank you guys you in 15 minutes. Thank nice. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.
Hi. Hi, see you. Hi, can you hear me well? Uh, yeah. Um, can you, I'm going to stop the screen share. Can you try to share your screen? Yes. Uh... Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen now? Uh, just one second. I think it's more on. on oh. I just have to close that other slide. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, welcome to the second half of our workshop. Uh, our first speaker will be Siu Tang. She's a professor uh, of the Computational Vision and Learning Group at ETH in Zurich. And she works on perceiving and modeling humans like uh, the her research, as you can see already on the first image, is like to uh, enable computational models to perceive humans, their pose, their motion and activities from like visual uh, input and to use that in like real world applications and digitizations of humans and her uh, work received many awards including uh, best paper awards and at 3dv and bmcv so without further ado uh see you uh very excited to hear your talk okay thank you thank you very much for the uh, introduction so uh, in this talk, I will present my group's work on human motion and interaction synthesis in 3D scenes. Okay, so synthesizing realistic uh, virtual humans is important uh, for many applications. So for example, here is uh, computer games. So here we need realistic and real-time human motion synthesis method. And also, we hope this motion can be controlled by users to uh, to have a good uh, like user experience, right? And also, like uh, other applications like virtual reality and augmented reality. So here, we also want to synthesize virtual humans to interact with real humans for some sports applications or entertainment applications. So what else? What other applications could be enabled by human motion synthesis models? So I think like computer games, uh, character animation, or some metaverse applications are all very important. But uh, in my group, so our goal is to basically bring virtual humans, uh, realistic virtual humans into real world simulators. So for example, for uh, training autonomous uh, cars or train robots, autonomous robots, right? People not often use real world simulations. And our goal is to bring realistic human behaviors, diverse and realistic human behaviors into this real world simulations so that uh, we can help, like uh, we can train better perception models to, uh, for these uh, autonomous agents. Okay, so next I want to put uh, like our work in a bit of a context in computer vision as well as in computer graphics, because both computer vision and computer graphics has studied human motion modeling and human motion synthesis. So traditionally, I think in computer vision, like uh, it's more like like motion prediction prediction task. So for example, given one second or two second human motion, one wants to predict the next one, two, or a bit longer motion, right? And then the focus is on accuracy and generalization. So meaning like we want, like what people often want is to predict accurate future motion. And also want to learn some model, people also want to learn some models that train on some actions, for example, walking, running, or other actions, and hope this model could generalize to other type of, of actions, right? So it's really focused on uh, accuracy and generalization. And character animation in computer graphics, I think the focus is a bit different. So character animations, here the focus is on uh, motion realism, right? Because we want like in computer games or in character animations, we want like these virtual characters to move realistically to have a good 
user experience, right? So the motion realism is a focus and also controllability is a focus. For example, if the user press a uh, right button, like right, like then the character turns right. So this type of controllability is also very important for character animation in graphics. And we have been working on this, like uh, synthesizing virtual humans uh, during the past like four years. And I think our focus is a bit in between, right? Because our goal is really to synthesize diverse and natural human motion and later behaviors. And we want this human motion the behavior models later help us to train like perception systems, for example, for cars, for AR glasses, for other like uh, uh, sensors, right? So this here is like a generalization is important. So we want to train on certain type of actions and generalize to, to other actions beyond the training set. At the same time, we also want like a motion realism because uh, if we want, if if we want these virtual humans to uh, like to really have training autonomous agents in real world simulation, they have to behave like real humans. So here is like uh, the focus is kind of in between. Okay, so this is an overview of my talk. So uh, for synthesis in virtual humans, right, uh, human motions, uh, my group we have like two uh, like uh, line of work. So the first line of work is, so the model behind it is generally motion primitive models and combined with RL based approach, right? So first I will talk about this line of work. And also recently we start to study like, or uh, to do some research on diffusion based approach. And I'm also very excited about this, this approach. I think these two directions, they, each has like pros and cons. So in the second part of my talk, I will discuss diffusion-based human motion synthesis. Okay, so for uh, for the first direction, right, this generative motion primitives and RL-based approach. So I will give uh, like an overview of these three works, right? So the leading authors are Yen and Kaifeng. And you can see this is the motion we can generate. Right. So given the viewpoint or the goal of virtual humans in a 3D environment, now our model can synthesize. I think it's pretty realistic. So we, we can synthesize realistic and diverse human motion, right? So even the goal is very simple, just reach the waypoint, reach the target on the floor. These virtual humans have different behaviors, right? So someone uh, walks really fast and someone like kind of wandering in this 3D environment. So what are the key ideas behind this lab work? So there are three key ideas. The first one is marker-based body representations. The second one is generative motion primitives. And the last one is motion control. So the first one, let's first look at this like marker-based representations, right? So this is like, it's probably not uh, like, uh, some people might be familiar with this because when you do motion capture, like a marker-based motion capture, you put markers on body surface, right? So we use the same type, same type of representations to represent 3D human body in motion. So the reasons are as follows. So first of all, like there are two type of, two kind of mo like a 3D body representations, right? The first one is you use some uh, parametric body models. So if you want to represent a body in motion, you have the PEVEX translation. And then you have the joint rotation, right? So this can really give you the, the 3D body in motion. And then the disadvantage of this approach, the advantage of this approach is like you really have valid body all the time. And the disadvantage is that you have to kind of combine the translation of the PEVEX and the joint rotation of the of the limbs. So if you if your model cannot combine these two information well, you have full skating. Right. And the second way of represent 3D human body in motion is just to use the joint location. And then you have the joint location for each joint in the Euclidean space. You basically model the translation of the joint locations. Uh, the good thing is RN or recurrent neural networks or deep networks handle this representation well. The, the disadvantage of it is it's lose the constraint of body shape. Right. And it's also lose the constraint, for example, for these orientations, right? If you just have the joint locations, you lose like this degree of freedom. 
So what we proposed back in CVPR 2021 is to use uh, uh, marker-based body representation. So basically we use surface marker to represent the whole body. So the good side thing about this representation is like, now we don't need to handle the rotation. It's really, you just have the translation of the markers in 3D space to represent the whole body. And another advantage is like, uh, this gave you better constraints than just joint location. So give you better constraints on the shape, give you better constraints on the poses, right? This rotation uh, like uh, along the limb, right? Okay. So this is a marker-based representation. And next I will tell you what is what do I mean by generative motion primitives? So here are basically the generative motion primitives. It's a very short motion, it's 0 0.25 second motion, right? So basically, this is like a given, for example, two second, uh, two frame motion. And then we have a model pre to predict the next or to generate the next eight frames. So if you take a closer look at each row, actually, uh, uh, like they have different future motions. The starting frames are the same, but the future uh, eight frames are different, right? So why do we do that? So our goal is really to generate virtual human to move kind of perpetually in the 3D environment. So move for a very long time. And we have been trying to do this for a very long time, for two years without success. And the reason for us is like we were we were trying to use the recurrent networks uh, GRUs to model long-term motion, and we were not able to train that, right? So we noticed when we use the GRU, for example, to model motion data, it's it's give you a good it's can model motion in a short term, but if you really want to go like perpetual motion, cannot handle that. It's just the modeling space is too big. So then the idea we had last year or the, the year before like uh, was like, let's not really try to use one model to model the perpetual motion. Let's try to use the GRU to model just a very short time, right? Given two frames, model the next eight frames. And then when we try to model the long-term motion, we just try, we just run this kind of motion primitives in a, uh, in a recurrent way. Right, recurrently. So by doing this, we hope the GRU, right, or uh, the, like our motion model can really handle, can really model the diversity in a very short term. And then when we do this recursively, our motion quality is still good, right? So that's, that's the idea. So the next, I will show you what is uh, uh, motion primitives. Uh, so let me move this. Here, right. So this is a, like uh, illustration of the motion primitives. So we have uh, uh, like uh, two frames, right? The first, the second frame, we represent the body as a marker location, as I explained uh, before, right? We have a GRU to encode this conditional information, and then for the during the training for the next eight frames, we again use GRU to represent it. We combine this conditional information and then the, the input information uh, to in a latent space. And then in the decoder, we basically, it's a variational auto uh, encoder combined with GRU. We kind of uh, recurrently uh, estimate or predict the next eight frames, right? So you can see this as a predicted uh, next eight frames, sorry, yes. And then one thing like we did uh, like back in 2021 is so for each for each frames, right? For each GRU, like the future frame we, we predict, we we actually also perform a projection uh, scheme. So basically it's optimization. So this optimization is basically trying to optimize the right body parameters. So simple parameter, simple parameters, so that at each frames, we, we really get the valid simple body. And then for the next GRU, we're basically not taking the predicted markers, but we take the, we take the markers that are uh, obtained from the optimized or fitted simple body so that we really get rid of this accumulated error, right? So basically then now our model is like given two uh, initial frames, like uh, for first frame and second frame, we can really predict the next eight frames in terms of simple parameters, right? Okay. And in the recent work, this is the CVPR 2022 work and recent archive work, we basically replace this projections optimization, which is can be which can be slow. We replace this 
projection with uh, uh, MLP so that at, uh, essentially this becomes much more efficient, right? So next, I will basically uh, group all these components, like this variational autoencoder combined with GRU, all these components into one block, right? So this generic motion primitives is what I have shown you in the previous slides. And now, basically, you can see given the first two frames, given a prior, now it's the inference right time. So we just sample from Gaussian prior Z, we can get the next eight frame. And when we want to generate the perpetual motion, long-term motion, what we do is just to, to run this motion primitives, generic motion primitives in a recurrent uh, way, right? So you can see uh, on the top are the perpetual motion, like it, this motion can really run for a long time, right? Uh, so yeah, so basically because it's generic motion primitives is very stable, reliable. So when we run this in a recurrent way, like we can get natural and nice like human motion. Yeah, but you can see like all these human motions are just randomly sampled. They don't do anything, right? They don't have any actions. They don't reach any goals. They don't have any behavior. It's just random human motion, but without much like skating or other artifacts, right? And there is no physics simulation. It's purely like this GRU based approach. So the, then it brings us to the like uh, next question. How do we do motion control? How do we uh, generate motions that have some goals, have some target, have some intention instead of just randomly sampled uh, motion, right? So here is like, uh, let's let's just study like, uh, like a very simple setting, right? So here, like our goal is to, to reach, to let the virtual human reach these waypoints, right? So the goal is like uh, the human motion is guided by the waypoints on the ground. And without any control, just to run our generative motion primitive in a recurrent way, uh, you can see like all the virtual humans, they just have random motions. They completely ignore these waypoints, right? They don't know about this waypoint. They don't know the existence of all these waypoints. And what we did now to really implement or to like model this motion control, we, we basically get inspired by this idea from motion VE. So we model this motion control as a Markov decision process uh, model. And in this MDP formulation, the state is basically uh, the body seat motion. So where am I, right? My first two frame motion. And where is my goal, right? So my goal could be here, my goal could be here, that then this that is a state, right? And then the model itself is a journey of motion primitive models, like I have just introduced. And the action is actually the latent variable of the journey of motion model, right? And we also have a policy network. It's basically a new network mapping from the state. So where am I, where is my goal to an action, so to a latent variable. And then this policy network produces latent variable, this action, so that when the generative motion model takes this action, takes this latent variable, it produces the next like eight frames to kind of drive my, my virtual body to reach the target, right? So that's the idea. And just like visually, this is what I have shown you before. This is the generative motion primitives models uh, to run it uh, recurrently, we generate like a random motion. And, and now with motion control, you can see the changes is like this, right? So the, we have a state, we have a policy network to help us to sample uh, like a uh, day, right? Before the day is sampled from Gaussian distribution. Now this day is kind of produced by this policy network. And then this policy network uh, like this day gives to like uh, its input to the general motion primitives models and this general motion primitive models produce a latent uh, produce uh, like the next uh, eight frame like diverse eight frames to drive my virtual humans to reach my goal right okay so I hope it's clear uh uh, and we train this algorithm with uh, PPO algorithms in this uh, advanced actor critique framework. We define a set of reward, for example, uh, like to encourage the virtual humans to reach the target as soon as possible, to encourage the valid uh, body pose, to encourage like uh, uh, like a foot no foot skating, right? So good contact and no skating. So we have a, a set of rewards to help us to train this uh, policy network. Okay, 
And in the recent work, we basically extend this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this walking like a motion model. We basically now we in the recent work we also make this 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 motion model scene aware, right? Basically 3D scene aware. So we have a local map where the, like we have a way to encode the local environment. So the virtual human now is also scene aware. And also we can, we get the, uh, the, the, the goal is not just the waypoint on the ground. The goal can also be some like a synthesis poses, right, a seating poses. And now we can get this virtual humans to uh, to move towards this guided uh, poses, right, to generate more diverse, like a uh, scene aware interaction, like uh, human scene interaction motion, right? Okay, so now I want to show you how, how does this policy gradually learn. So again, you can see this is the beginning, right? We don't train the policy network. Uh, and then the, all the virtual humans just have random motion and ignore these waypoints, right? And then we start to train the policy network. So the generative motion primitives is fixed. So we start to train this policy network. And you can see all the virtual humans trying to reach this to this waypoint, but with weird poles, right? So the the, the policy network cannot really produce a good latent variable that is also produced like a valid human motion, right? And we continue our training so it gets better, but still the motion quality is not good. And after training, like, I don't know, half, half a day, maybe one day. So you can see like now all the virtual humans have a natural movement and they all uh, try to reach the goal in a very diverse way, right? I, everyone has different trajectories, everyone has different speed. So it's kind of really diverse uh, and realistic, arguably human behavior, right? So this is another example. So we have the waypoint in the 3D space and you can see all these waypoints, uh, like uh, it's kind of, helps the virtual humans to navigate in the 3D environment. And we just have one model and it works for different uh, body shape. So you can see there's small person, bigger person, uh, and also like a generate really diverse human behaviors. So this is an interesting one, like uh, trying to reach the goal in like a, uh, in a very different way. And someone really walk very fast and someone just like, wandering around, right? Walks very slow. Like, I think it's kind of the worst way of reaching uh, the target. And here is another example from the latest work where we can synthesize detailed human scene interaction. And these are all like a samples from our model. So they have the same initial pose, but the first target is here to sit here, the second target to sit here. And here becomes interesting. So this virtual human just like, spontaneously like it seems to try to sit here, but didn't because we didn't actually set a target here. And then this virtual humans, okay, uh, like uh, catch up, right? I don't know, like uh, follow all the others to reach the final target. Okay, so this is the first direction. I think I'm, uh, I might not have enough time, but I want to like uh, quickly go through the, a uh, guided motion diffusion uh, for controllable human synthesis. This is a very new work we just put on archive, but I'm very excited about it. So the starting point of this work is from this nice like uh, uh, work, Eichler work uh, this year. So motion diffusion models. So basically this work show us like we can now with diffusion models, we can really generate nice realistic, expressive human motion by just giving attacks, right? A man kick with uh, their uh, left leg and you can see it's kick with their left leg. It's very expressive motion. But all these motions, right, this work, the motion is isolated from the 3D environment, right? So it's just motion, human motion. The, the motion is not really related to the 3D environment. And the key question in this work we want to answer is how do we incorporate spatial constraints in the denoising diffusion model for human motion synthesis? So that's a key question we want to answer. And then our goal is like this. So the input as a text could be, and also could be text keyframe locations, basically the pavex locations and very sparse 
uh, locations. For example, for 100 frames motion, we might just specify two or three or five locations and also keyframe locations and some obstacles to avoid, right? And the output is a 3D body in motion. And our objectives are quite, we are ambitious, right? The first is we want to learn all possible motion. So text descript motions, not just a few specific action that like what we can generate in the, in the RL based approach where we only have walking, sitting, lying, running this type of motion. We want to, learn all possible text descript motions. And also we want motion to allow to follow the spatial constraints. Okay, so I will quickly go through this. Uh, the key problem here is really the sparsity in the guidance, right? So this is like the motion representation for one frame. So normally there are four like a, a digit, like a four like a, a dimension to represent the Pavex location, like the keyframe locations and all the others represent the joint, like the local articulation, right? And then if you put all these frames together, right? For example, 200 frames, you can see this is a full motion representation. It's like an image. And then there is a sparsity issues, right? Because we only specify like a key locations, right? Just very sparse locations. So we have a sparse guidance in channel as well as sparse guidance in time. Right. So if you think about it, it's like you want to synthesize an image, but you only specify a few pixels value. And then during the diffusion process, the model can easily ignore this a few pixels, just treat them as a as a noise. Right. So the first thing we did, one solution is this unprocessed projection. So basically, we, we first uh, uh, have a scalar for the trajectories. So for this for this row, and we we basically have a random uh, matrix, and then we multiply this random matrix with this with this motion representation. We get this projected motion, right? So this projected motion actually is this idea is simple, but this inherent local motion that is not aligned well with uh, with for example the trajectory actually can be uh, like really solved by this projected motion. So we call this emphasis projection. Okay, another problem of this is like a sparsity in guidance, right? So for diffusion model, for people who knows diffusion model, you know, like there are also, there are like classifier based guidance, right? So this is a standard diffusion uh, process. So this is more noisy human motion. And then during the denoising de process, we get like cleaner, clean, cleaner motion, right? So we could have this classifier based guidance, for example, the, uh, the avoidance, like the, the, the obst obstacles or like uh, the key locations. And uh, basically this G is a goal function or C is a classifier, right? And this is a post hoc, uh, post -hoc method. So basically this guidance, we just need to compute the gradient with respect to the, to the X. So we don't really need to change the DPM itself. So it's, this is a very flexible way to do the conditioning during the uh, diffusion process. So the problem here is uh, guidance is too sparse. Right. So if you think about this is a noise image and this this is very sparse. It's just a few locations. And because the guidance is very sparse, so it will look uh, incoherent to other parts. And then our motion model will think like this guidance are actually noise and just ignore them. Right. So what we proposed uh, to solve this in this work is called dense signal uh, propagation. So basically our observation is any denoiser can be used to propagate this guidance from the clean clean input to the noise uh, noisy like uh, noisy intermediate representations so basically we can really propagate this guidance to the neighbors right and luckily for the diffusion models we can use the diffusion model itself to compute this dense signal so the insight is to turn this sparse uh, signal into a dense signal, we need domain knowledge, right? We need to know like how to turn this sparse signal to the, to the dense signal. And the way to achieve it is basically by using the denoising function, which is trained on a motion data set by denoise, by de, uh, to denoise. So doing this, we can gather like the information from the neighboring frames to the to, to one frame, right? So this denoiser itself has a domain knowledge and can help us to 
to to uh, to to basically propagate this dense signal information. Okay, so here I want to show you some results uh, very quickly. So, okay, so here is a, like the text input. So this is the person jumps and turn left uh, mid air, and you can see actually the MDM doesn't really turn left; it turns right. And our model basically turns like uh, have really follow follow this uh, instruction, right? And also the next one. Uh, so basically, here the the text input is a person stand up and walk uh, uh, clockwise in a circle and then sit back, right? But you can see the MDM actually the person never stand up or uh, or sit down and also walk. Uh, counterclockwise, right, counterclockwise. And this is what we can do in our model. Actually, it's follow the text description better. And here, like uh, the person walks backward and you can see uh, the baseline basically switch, the person switch from walk backward to walking uh, forward. Okay. And also start to do some weird poses. And this is uh, what we proposed with our representation. And now with text uh, and trajectory. So basically the MDM cannot really handle this. You really see a lot of foot skating, right? And with our like uh, 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 that signal propagation, I mean, I don't think it's perfect. There are also foot skating in our model. Uh, there are more foot skating here, but I think it's, uh, it's it's already like a uh, improvement like with this classifier based approach. So here is a uh, keyframe uh, locations, and here we can basically get the motion by this keyframe locations, right? Okay. So what we have seen so far. So I have talked about two ways to generate human motion, realistic human motion. So one is generative motion primitives with IO-based motion control. And my so my takeaway is like the motion quality here is good, right? So we don't really see much for skating. The motion quality is natural and good diversity if you think about like walking or sitting, but there are limited action types. The motion is not very exp expressive, right? So it's very limited action type. But on the other hand, the diffusion-based motion modeling, so the motion quality could be improved because we still see the foot skating when we consider considering the uh, spatial constraints, but the motion itself is very expressive, right? It can be controlled by arbitrary text and it's really can, it, like we can generate rich natural human motion. And I think, the next step would be how to really combine these two lines of work, right? So how to really have a human motion generation framework where like we have a good motion quality, good diversity at the same time, it can be, for example, controlled by text and can really generate a very expressive and rich uh, human motion. So I think I will stop here because uh, I'm already like, uh, uh, using 30 minutes, half an hour. So this is uh, like the people from my group and presenting their work and also uh, published work like the code, data and model are available on our website. So thank you very much. Thanks to you. I guess we have like time for just one or two quick questions. Yeah, I can repeat it. Oh. Uh, my question, so thank you for the talk. I don't know if you can hear me in here. Um, there's a microphone. Thanks. So mm. thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, so thanks. Uh, at the beginning, you said your goal uh, or your idea was to synthesize humans in a uh, real world, more or less. Um, so in real world, sometimes, most of the times, human 
uh, tend to form groups and interact with each other. Do you think uh, it would be interesting to um, research that aspect as well? So try to generate human motion in groups and trying to model interactions as well? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That is uh, actually we have a we have a project that I didn't include in the so we recently had a project to synthesize like using our based approach and gentle motor primitives to synthesize uh, multiple people like walking together. So they can avoid each other, uh, but they cannot form a group. But basically what we can do now is they can avoid each other in a very diverse way. So uh, yeah, but I, I I cannot show the video now, but like that's, I think that is very important if we think about to really bring virtual humans into real world simulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for the great talk. Uh, in the conclusion phase on machine synthesis, did you notice that the diversity job when you use it used to be classified by I don't I don't I cannot if the diversity drops? Yeah. I think the qu question was like if the diversity in the generated motions drops uh with the classifier based guidance versus classifier free guidance. Ah. Hmm. I mean, compared to what? Uh, you mean the classifier based and the classifier free, both conditions? Oh, I don't remember because like the classifier based approach was I presented and we have the recent classifier free. We are studying that, but I don't remember the diversity. How to, I, I, don't, I don't have this information at the moment. So what I can tell is from our like ex experience is classifier based, Conditioning is very flexible, but classifier free, uh, like conditioned approach, like if you train it really well, the motion quality is much better. Okay, uh, thanks again, see you for the great presentation. Uh, it was very nice. And uh, now I'm very excited to uh, introduce Wei Jan, who is the co-director of Berkeley Deep Drive. And uh, he's also leading the autonomous driving group uh, in the systems of that. And his research really focuses on everything that is autonomous uh, driving, uh, including perception and prediction, planning, uh, controlling, um, as well as uh, constructing, constructing uh, data sets, uh, simulation testing, so really everything basically.
hope there, there won't be any acoustic problem there. Okay, great. Sorry about that. And uh, the second part would be how we can main, uh, make the uh, offline data engine to be more efficient and automated because uh, there has to be a lot of uh, users data uploaded when there are too many, uh, when there are a huge amount of data that we can collect from the real world. And there will involve a lot of human labelers to uh to uh create the like uh, label data for our training so we want to uh, replace that with active learning uh, from uh, for the data selection as well as the auto labeling as uh, with the self supervision to really the pipeline to be more efficient so uh regarding the uh, online online perception part so uh there are some recent work uh, published from our group which is enabling monocular uh, 3D detection by utilizing the temporal input, how we can uh, really uh, take the advantage of the historical frame to help with the detection of the current frame. And that also achieved the uh, SODA on the new scenes 3D detection benchmark. And another recent work that we published on archive right now is the early stage uh, ladder camera fusion, which is utilizing the uh, sparse features of both uh, modalities. And when it goes to the uh, efficient and automated data pipeline, one of the aspects that we are emphasizing right now is how we can select the most, for, most useful part of the data. And uh, what you can see from, uh, from this figure is like, um, when there are a huge amount of data collected from, the, uh, from our fleet, there might be uh, only a small part of it to be highly useful for our training. So we, we are trying to propose some active learning based method to even uh, which is even able to have a single pass inference on the edge computing side to help us determine why are the single frame that right now we are receiving would be useful for our uh, for our uh, like training of the uh, perception or even the uh, downstream uh, modules. And uh, this year in CPR we also have another paper which is uh, addressing how we can select most most useful part of the data to uh, facilitate our uh, like fine tuning with a unsupervised pre-training frame, uh, framework. And uh, the next part I wanna address would be the auto-labeling side. So uh, there is a behavior data set that we constructed from the auto-labeling algorithm that we are trying to utilize, uh, that we are trying to utilize the perception algorithm to automatically label the uh, drone footage to construct highly interactive data set uh, for the uh, behavior uh, for the interactions. And what you can see here, let me see how I can play the videos. Okay. So in this data set, we collected a lot, a lot of highly interactive situations where vehicles would be competing with each other in the run merging scenario or there could be uh, linear collision cases uh, in the intersection scenarios. And uh, with our auto-labeling methods, we can uh, review the uh, ground truth of the trajectories in a highly accurate uh, manner. And there are 11 scenarios uh, from four countries published with the corresponding semantic HD maps with around 1,000 minutes and a lot of tra uh, highly inter interactive trajectories of the vehicles, as well as pedestrians and cyclists. And with the auto-labeling uh, auto uh, algorithms, the next uh, step that we want to emphasize would be how we can utilize both the small portion of the uh, human label data set, as well as the large amount of unlabeled data sets to enable the training of our algorithm. So um, the uh, corresponding methodology will be semi-supervised learning. So it is trying to utilize the auto-label data, which is uh, labeled by some algorithm trained from the human label data and combining both to train our uh, algorithm to be utilized on our, on our autonomous vehicle. And in this work, we are also trying to combine the 2D and 3D modalities so that we can utilize the advantages of both. So for 2D, it's more uh, good at uh, detecting small objects like the pedestrian from the uh, rich textures, while from 3D data is more good at, uh, it's better at uh, dealing with some occluded vehicles. And on the Waymo open data set, you can see it can 
uh, such kind of uh, 2D and 3D joint semi-supervised learning can help us avoid a lot of false positive as mis detections. And uh, with all those uh, automated uh, data pipeline, as well as the uh, like online 3D perception algorithm, uh, next I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the main th uh, theme of this of this talk, which is uh, how we can customize behavior learning from uh, offline to sim to real. So uh, for behavior learning, there are three major domains that we are mainly considering. So we could have a lot of offline behavior data collected from the real world. And we also uh, ex we are also expecting the, uh, in the simulation, we could either train or test our uh, ego policy with pretty human-like uh, behavior models with the, uh, with the uh, real-time interactions. And on real road test, uh, we are trying to deploy our uh, deploy our algorithms, and we are expecting to uh, customize or adapt such kind of policy. So uh, the motivation of the work is like we are starting from the imitative models trained from those offline data, and we want to see how we can customize both the ego policy that we want to deploy in a vehicle, as well as the reaction model in the simulation so that we can either uh, customize the training of a EO policy or like uh, see in different kinds of reactions, how our algorithm will react. And finally, when it goes to the real world uh, deployment, we also want to have the online adaptation for the policies. So, um, for those customization of the behavior learning, we are dealing with this from two major perspectives. One is uh, more data centric, the other would be more uh, reward centric. So uh, let me uh, briefly mention the two representative works uh, one by one. So for the data centric one, what we are trying to uh, what we are trying to emphasize is to utilize the data augmentation as well as auto labeling of the behavior features to enable editable uh, driver character uh, characters in the uh, interactive traffic simulation for the testing or even training of the driving policy. So uh, here is the uh, major motivation. So we are expecting some socially controllable behavior generation so that we can have a user specified courtesy level to control how courteous or selfish or aggressive the behavior would be. And um, the major problem that we, we have to consider first would be how we should quantify such a kind of uh, social factor, how courteous or selfish the vehicle would be. And that would resort to some previous work that we have. So the essence of those work is that we are trying to define or say quantify courtesy <laughs> from the reward function perspective. That is, um, we are constructing two uh, items, the uh, cost function, which corresponds to the selfish, uh, or say the individual vehicles uh, benefits, as well as the other factor that is quantifying how we are impacting the others benefits with or without the behavior or existence of our own vehicle. And uh, this is some uh, results from our previous work, which we can uh, achieve much more human-like and courteous behavior by incorporating such, uh, such an item in the cost function by utilizing max entropy inverse reinforcement learning. And we are further extending this into the concept of egoism or courte uh, courteous or confident policy with, by combining some model-based planning methods but the problem for those work is like first the in, uh, max entropy inverse reinforcement learning with the linear combination of the cost uh, in the cost function have pretty limited capacity to learn from the uh, large amount of uh, human driving data. And the other would be the scalability of such kind of algorithm is also a little bit troublesome to enable multi agent multi vehicle uh, interactions. So that's why we are thinking about this, not only from a socially controllable perspective, but also the scalability and uh, like human-like behavior uh, learning uh, perspective, how we can enable the interactions of many agents to make their uh, reactive behavior to be human-like 
as well as controllable with the courtesy level. And we are following our previous quantification or the definition for the courteous level in a data-driven way. So that uh, given the uh, like future trajectory of the vehicle B, that it, which is uh, for, for which we are generating the uh, trajectories in the reactive behavior generation, we are able to quantify this courteous la courtesy level. And uh, we are con constructing some uh, courtesy level auto labeling module when there are like situation X as well as the behavior of the vehicle B uh, input into the uh, into the module. We we are able to utilize a marginal predictor as well as a conditional predictor trained from large amount of uh, driving data to identify will be the difference of the expected reward in different situations is that with vehicle B or without the behavior of vehicle B, what would be the difference of vehicle A's uh, reward? And it can directly output the courtesy level of the uh, like vehicle B's behavior. So with such kind of courtesy labeling uh, module, what we can do right now is we can also train the uh, another like uh, marginal predictor generating the behavior of the vehicle A and uh, input that into uh, into this uh, like uh, courtesy labeling module so that we can generate the corresponding labels to be compared with the courtesy uh, to be compared with the output of the uh, of the generated behavior for vehicle B with our uh, targets socially controllable behavior generation model. And we can also utilize the uh, generated uh, trajectory of vehicle B with the, this uh, courtesy labeling module to input uh, a like scalar into the uh, designed ve uh, vehicle behavior generation model. So that we can utilize the loss of the trajectory as well as the loss of the courtesy uh, the cur uh, courtesy level to supervise the behavior generation model. And then on the, for the online inference stage, we can directly utilize the, modu uh, the modules in the middle. And then uh, with the uh, single scalar that we want to input for the courtesy level, we can directly control the outputs of this uh, YB regarding the uh, uh, regarding different uh, like social socially uh, regarding the social controllable behavior generation and here are some examples that I want to show so uh, with in this uh, like uh, merging uh, or lane change scenario you can see that with different levels of uh, courteous, uh, courteous uh, inputs the via uh, the control the vehicle B would have more more and more uh, like accelerations when merging into the lane so that it would not affect the speed of vehicle A, which is holding the right of way in such kind of scenario. And similar uh, story will apply to this uh, lane change scenario. So when we are getting more and more courteous, the vehicle A will get less and less impact regarding this benefit. And when it goes to the yielding uh, scenarios, like those examples, when we are trying to control the vehicle B to be more courteous, it will, it will just try to avoid uh, interfering the future trajectory of vehicle A by yielding them uh, in, in this uh, like merging scenario. So after talking about the uh, like customizing the behavior learning from a more data-centric perspective, Another perspective uh, that I want to talk about is uh, to control that from the reward side. So this is uh, a recent work that we uh, published onto the archive. So uh, the essence of this work is like this. So when we are uh, when we train some uh, like imitative policy from large amount of offline data, we could assume that there is an inherent uh, policy there which has some corresponding reward that we don't know. But when we are trying to think about some uh, task that we want to tackle in the real world, either it's something that we want to try to uh, adapt on, uh, online or some new goals that we want to uh, customize offline, 
We want to have another desired policy to be adapted from the existing one with some different goals or specified uh, preferences or even some specific constraints. Now we want to robustify this pre-trained prior policy. So the question will be how we can achieve this. So we are thinking about this from the uh, reward perspective because um, there could be some uh, implicit uh, reward function existing there that we don't know, which would lead to the uh, uh, the uh, pol prior policy that we obtain from large amount of human data. So with such kind of unknown uh, reward, as well as another reward that we want to achieve as the added reward for the desired goals or behavior. So what we want to do is to formulate a new, uh, a new Q function, which contains both of the, uh, of the reward, where one of them that, one of them that we don't know. So we, we, we are kind of, uh, we are kind of like uh, have some mathematical derivation to uh, get a residual Q function where there is a new defined reward as well as the prior policy. And we can avoid uh, having the unknown reward function in such kind of residual Q function. And we can transform the problem into solving a uh, solved uh, Bellman equation where there's only a new defined reward, a desired reward as well as a prior policy there. So with such kind of uh, formulation, what we can do is to uh, incorporate several kinds of practical algorithm, including soft key learning or SAC. And we can even enable that for online policy uh, customization with the max maximum entropy Monte Carlo tree search. And here is what uh, here are some examples that we want to show for the offline policy customizations, both for the highway and parking scenarios. So the basic policy for highway, we are trying to um, like max, uh, we are trying to uh, have some desired speed, avoid collisions with the others, and we want to add another goal, which is trying to stay on the very right lane. And uh, for the parking scenario, what we are trying to do is to achieve the goal. And the added one would be avoid hitting the boundary, which, which is the uh, lane markings uh, on the ground. So, yeah. So it's like um, with the added uh, reward, with our method, we can achieve such kind of goal. And in the quantitative results, we can see that the added reward can will, will be increased uh, significantly while the uh, basic reward would remain uh, pretty much similar. And when we assume that we already know the uh, implicit reward of the prior policy, we can, we can train something together as the uh, uh, comp uh, another comparable baseline. And our proposed method can achieve very similar uh, level of the reward compared with, with that one. And we are also trying to customize the uh, online. Uh, we are also trying to uh, enable online policy customization with Monte Carlo tree search. And actually, uh, in in the uh, corresponding quantitative result, you can also see similar kind of trends. For and it's also quite possible that we can utilize this online Monte Carlo tree search to guarantee safety. Uh, given that we would have pretty good prediction of the other's future behavior. So uh, after talking about those uh, urban or highway or parking related driving scenarios, another perspective that I want to talk about for uh, customizing the behavior learning would be uh, autonomous racing setting ups. So uh, we, uh, we are working with uh, our sponsor uh, in the... Uh, in the uh, Gran Turismo game, where there are extremely high fidelity simulation for the vehicle dynamics. And there are also uh, like human research which can directly input their behavior that we can learn from or compete with. So there are two different kinds of settings, time trial as well as the uh, adversarial uh, racing. So uh, in order to deal with those extremely complicated vehicle dynamics, we need to resort to some uh, like um, 
we would need to resort to some uh, complicated, uh, sophisticated vehicle models, either from the mathematical perspective or the machine learning perspective, and apply that to the uh, some model-based control methods to achieve uh, superhuman performances. And when it goes to the adversarial racing, we need to consider, for example, how we can uh, both consider the long-term and short-term strategies simultaneously to compete with human drivers. And that's uh, why we are working on this. Uh, we have proposed this skill critique methodology, which can uh, enable this. And another uh, important uh, problem that we want to tackle would be how we can uh, customize the training uh, the, the training agents to compete with our ego uh, racer. So uh, in the uh, racing setup, the, the major difference between the uh, recent setup as well as urban or highway driving is that the human data that we can collect is much uh, would be much sparse. So it's not that easy to for us to enable the pre uh, to utilize the previous methodologies we propose, and that's why we resort to another uh, setting, which which is uh, multi agent re. Uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. And we are utilizing diverse uh, trained partners to be utilized. And we want to apply those concepts into the racing scenario. And this corresponds to some ongoing work that we have for this uh, virtual reactions plus the software in loop test. And for racing, another uh, key factor that we want to consider would be uh, there, we, we, we could see a lot of demands uh, how we can include the vehicles in the loop for such kind of uh, close test. And there are also uh, expert human researchers that can directly uh, input their, uh, their racing policies. So we want to we want to have both of uh, both the vehicles as well as human in the loop by constructing some uh, mixed reality settings. So this is some pre, uh, preliminary work that we have by utilizing our test vehicles. So here is a uh, digital twin that we uh, constructed with a autonomous, with the autonomous vehicles in the test track, which is uh, reacting with the human drivers, which is driving this yellow vehicle, as well as another human pedestrian wearing the VR here in our lab. So uh, in this uh, like roundabout scenario, there is a pedestrian trying to uh, cross the street, which corresponds to this human uh, pedestrian, as well as another yellow vehicle driven by this human driver. And they are both interacting with our autonomous vehicle. And here is, what's the, uh, here is what she can see in her VR. And the vehicle, the blue vehicle corresponding to this real vehicle, is entering the roundabout and trying to yield to this human pedestrian who is walking too slow. And then the uh, autonomous vehicle enter the roundabout, interact with the yellow vehicle driven by this human driver. And the human driver can have several emergency brakes bully this autonomous vehicle, which is pretty dangerous. And actually, we don't have to have the autonomous vehicle or the human-driven vehicle or the pedestrian to really experience any danger happening here. But we can still test such kind of scenario. So we are also uh, extending this into the uh, recent sightings where there could be uh, like highly sophisticated vehicle dynamics, which can hardly be well uh, modeled into the uh, real simulation and we can include more uh, human expert into the loop to test the corresponding algorithms. So those are some of the uh, recent uh, work, ongoing work or the recently published work that I wanna uh, like present. So I'll be happy to take questions from audiences. Thank you. Uh, the Tesla again screen to look like the uh, the real world as a three different geometries and the world. Uh, is that true? So yeah, uh, no, it's like it's like this. So uh, actually, this is an open space in our test field, and we are pretending that there is a complicated scenario that our real autonomous vehicle is experiencing. We are directly importing the complex, uh, the highly interactive 
roundabout scenario into the digital twin. And our autonomous vehicle is receiving the corresponding signal as well as the HD map in real time so that it can interact with the uh, with different kinds of uh, surrounding human or pedestrian or the vehicles. Thank you. Yeah, great question. So it's like this, because uh, we are utilizing our uh, campus internet and it's directly uh, connected between the uh, test field as well as our uh, lab. So there, the latency is pretty low. It's like a uh, millisecond level. But uh, when it goes to the internet, which is like pretty far with several handshakes, there, there might be some latency problem experienced for the typical games that uh, was played from international players. Oh, okay. So actually, uh, for the imitation learning model that is mentioned in the uh, uh, in in the presentation, it was like we are we are utilizing the reward that we assume we are uh, we assume we don't know, but we already set up it there, and we utilize that to train some uh, reinforcement policy to generate the corresponding trajectories or the actions, and then utilize that to supervise another imitation learning policy directly util utilized in some simple imitation learning models. So that, that is the, the setup for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, our last speaker is Rami Alfo. Uh, he's going to talk about efficient and scalable behavior models. And uh, he's a staff research scientist at uh, Waymo. And he leads there the team that builds foundational models for motion and driving uh, based on large language models, which is also like his, his background. He was previously a, a, a lead researcher at uh, Google where he's also focused on uh, pre-training large language models, but not only that, uh, also uh, in general, extending uh, uh, to better architectures for understanding large-scale data, including uh, graphs. So uh, without further ado, thanks Rami for, for joining us. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, can you hear me very well? Uh, yep, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, everything is presented. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this is Rami, um, a research scientist at the Waymo Research uh, team. Um, today, I'm going to be uh, presenting our uh, uh, teamwork on developing and deploying uh, um, machine learning models that are, uh, you know, um, uh, efficient and scalable uh, to guarantee, you know, smooth and uh, safe driving. Um, first, let me thank the organizing for inviting me. Unfortunately, I could not have uh, made it to the conference, but I hope you guys are having uh, plenty of fun. So 
That being said, um, uh, just to go over the background of what an autonomous uh, vehicle stack look like, um, we start usually with the basic inputs of a predefined map, pre-compiled map, and the sensory inputs. And then we would like to ask the following questions. Uh, first, given the sensor, we would like to identify using a perception stack, uh, detect, detect the object, track them across time, segment the scene, and so on. So basically, the, the, what we are trying to answer is where are the things in the scene? Second, we follow with behavior prediction, where our question is, where are the things uh, will be next? And usually our horizon you know, is from five seconds to 10 seconds in the future. We follow with that, given both identifying where objects are and where our predictions they will end up being. Uh, we would like to propose a plan that depends on the road topography and map uh, that where should we go next to achieve our goals. And the plan will be compiled to controls that will be basically accelerating the car and maneuvering it around. As you could see, uh, these three green boxes are mainly based on machine learning models. And today my talk will be covering the behavior prediction and planner. Okay. So for us to build foundational models that are efficient and scalable, we really have to scale up three components. So here my diagram shows you that uh, what we think at um, we think in terms of uh, when it comes to you know um, quite efficient machine learning models that are scalable. First, we want models that are easy to design, optimize, and tune, and uh, can adapt to vary, uh, variable number of inputs and outputs. Uh, second, we would like to have uh, have for them you know uh, rich internal representation and output representation, um, such that it allows downstream tasks to modify these you know prediction in in different ways to achieve the goals you know for um, safe driving. And finally. All of these models are based on statistical learning and without enough uh, sufficient data in terms of equality and volume, we will not be able to uh, learn you know, quite sufficient models. So let me start with models. Um, basically, just to give you a sense what exactly the behavior of modeling looks like in reality, we observe the world state uh, in terms of agent history, traffic light and road network. And we would like to take these multiple modalities and apply a deep neural network to predict basically for every agent in the scene, uh, the most likely K trajectories, K outcomes. And the trajectory just for simplicity could be just a time series of X, Y position and the heading of the vehicle with some uncertainty. So um, we started the, working on this with the first paper on multipath. And uh, we presented you know, uh, Gaussian mixture models that basically uh, produced by a neural network uh, that run in the ego frame of each agent. So we run the model per agent in the scene and uh, in its ego frame, and we produce the most likely trajectories. And just to get you a sense, what does that mean? Um, basically, um, you could see here, this, uh, there are pedestrians, there are cyclists, there are cars, and you could see like a highly interactive scene where one car is waiting for the other or the pedestrian you know, we might be thinking the pedestrian uh, might would like to, um, you know, uh, cross the road, but maybe they continue and so on. And you could see that uh, the horizon I'm showing you here is basically up to eight seconds with um, variable uh, certainty at each level. So this is our first work. And um, what we noticed that our problem came evolving in complexity and uh, richness. And we have been applying what I would call the artisanal methodology of working with it, where we basically uh, design um, models and um, pipelines for machine learning that are extremely specific to the autonomous driving, um, where we have a specialized network for every modality, specialized wiring of these modalities together, and fusing them in different you know, specialized ways. And we found that that not to be quite maintainable and scalable and lead to bottlenecks when we scale up the models in, in, in capacity. So what we opted in is to figure out a different methodology. And I would like to call it like more of a factory. We would like more of a systematic way to produce models. So imagine the cars in this image is just our models. And we have a, a basically streamlined uh, process that produce these models. And for us to achieve that goal, um, I want to give you a sense first is that what is really this complexity I'm talking about. So you could see here the input. We only have three modalities, uh, road graph, uh, traffic light, and the agent history. And even with the three, these are three, you could see there is a lot of 
uh, asymmetric wiring of these components. We also have our own in-house um, attention layers, for example, called multi-context gating. And it's really hard to reason about uh, such diagram and model and um, makes it hard to figure out like how do you scale these components in computing capacity. So this is our multipath plus plus. So you could see from multipath, we the model evolved in complexity and we found that not to be quite uh, maintainable. So we want to, to sit down and rethink about like our strategy uh, and design goals that will adapt us to the next phase of uh, uh, our model. So our goals is simple. Um, we want an architecture that's simple, no domain expertise. You don't have to be an expert in autonomous driving to understand how the machine learning model should be designed. Uh, hopefully it is uh, tunable with easy parameters to uh, control for uh, quality and uh, speed and latency and scalable. It does not introduce any architectural bottlenecks that will not allow the larger, larger models to show benefits in quality. Okay, so we put these constraints and I hope that these constraints also help other people designing their neural networks. Um, we wanted it, the, the architecture to be homogeneous and parsimonious and by homogeneous, basically, we would like to treat most of all of the modalities equally. Uh, we want symmetry in the connections. Uh, you could see this is quite opposite, where we have a different neural network for every domain, and they connected in various ways. Um, what is the ultimate test for a good design? You can describe it almost in a sentence. Uh, there is no need for you to, you know, um, you know, almost write papers just to say what exactly the architecture. So, key design questions. If we're gonna build it from blocks that are homogeneous and connected in a symmetric way, what is the building block, block will be? How to fuse these input modalities and how to model interactions between space and time. So as you will not be surprised from the introduction, I have spent more than 15 years uh, working in the NLP domain. So my first uh, choice will be, let's use it on top. Uh, let's use our building block to be uh, attention uh, networks, self-attention and cross-attention. And what you see here is the general formulation we are coming up with, uh, given a scene of driving, we have a self-attention uh, transformer encoder that takes multiple modalities and encode them into small number of vectors. Then given learned seed, we will use a cross-attention transformer to cross-attend to these representation of the scene and produce different trajectories for every agent. So our first choice is to figure out, let's, let's um, canonicalize most of our learning through self-attention and cross-attention. Now we come to the second question, how do you fuse your modalities? Now we chose the building block, as you would imagine, there is you know, the well-studied approaches. You can start with an early fusion where you take all the modalities, concatenate them in homogeneous way, then feed them one time to a self-attention uh, encoder network. You can go the opposite direction where you can say, oh, well, I will assign a specific network of the same type though to each of these modalities. And you could go for hierarchical fusion or many fusion. Now, most of our modalities exist in two dimensions, space and time. And there's different ways on how to build attention over these multi-axis you know, uh, domains. So you could attend first to time, or you could first attend to attention, or you can jointly flatten these uh, 2D structure to 1D structure and do multi-axis attention. Of course, how, if you're going to attend for each one alone, how do you build your transformer block? Do you attend first to time, then um, space, or space, then time? Um, or you just attend for you know, several blocks of time first, then you move to uh, space, and so on. So we studied all of these variations. Uh, and basically, we built a big grid of choices in our waveformer paper presented this year at ECRA, where we studied different types of fusion, factorization, and different types of attention. The paper is full of uh, results and studies and insights that I encourage you to look at. Uh, but really the, the, the main lessons I want you to go with is, we took the simplest setup, which is uh, you know, early fusion, high fusion with late fusion, and we plot them ag against uh, you know, amount of compute measured by latency. And you could see that on the small latency, on the small models, um, late fusion was doing very well. And on the high end, for more, the most expensive ones, early fusion seems quite to be sufficient. And in the middle end, you would imagine a mid fusion would be you know, uh, working very well. To prove the point that these simple uh, models are quite efficient and quite able to produce quality results, we took our early fusion model, 
with multi-axis attention, for example, here. And we were able basically to produce the state of art results for outperforming previous models that were designed to be in autonomous driving domain. So we removed domain expertise. Uh, we were able to um, choose between quality and speed and achieve state of art results you know, with really simple uh, design. Here is uh, some of the visualizations we have. And you could see uh, this car is trying to yield to the pedestrians here. Um, and uh, this car is also yielding to the other pedestrian here. And there's plenty of interactions. And here you could see we are predicting up to eight seconds with different you know, amount of certainty about our uh, predictions. So as I mentioned, this is all run ego frame for every single agent. So for every one of these agents, we run the network to predict its own um, uh, uh, trajectories. So you would imagine, is there a better output representation than just predicting one agent at a time? The motivation here is basically, you know, this is a lot of redundant and repeat computation. So we looked at diffusion as a way to predict for multiple agents simultaneously. Basically, um, we imagine uh, the trajectories to be uh, noisy points in the space, and we try to refine them and denoise them. Uh, till they reach, you know, um, uh, a multi-motor distribution, as you can see here. And this paper is presented uh, at the current CP CVBR. So I, you know, I encourage you to go um, look, uh, look, um, attend the talk. So we had two types of diffusion: one unguided, where we want to capture all kinds of mode, and another where we would like to realize the most um, reasonable trajectories that will end up with a specific volume mode. Um, so it's targeted diffusion. Okay. So how does that work? Remember our previous network where we had a scene encoder that's uh, based on an early fusion transformer self-attention, uh, produce a summary of the scene, and we have uh, we probe it with different queries to basically produce different trajectories um, with a transformer cross-attention using a Gaussian mixture model. That was our marginal predictions. And to do multi-agent prediction, we're going to replace this predictor while keeping the scene encoder the same. So we will do the multi-agent training with diffusion in the following way. We will take the ground truth trajectories for our agents, add noise to them, and basically um, ask the model to recover the original uh, ground truth by predicting the noise. Once it predicts the noise, then we subtract the noise from the noisy, basically, uh, trajectories. So our denoiser, as you'd imagine, a transformer cross attention, and that produces the ground truth back. During inference, Basically, we sample uh, random trajectories from a Gaussian, uh, uh, almost you know, a kind of a garbage you know, squiggling, and we apply the denoiser network, uh, optionally more than once. Uh, also, optionally, we can add constraint and goals, and we are able to recover the you know, reasonable predictions. When we, uh, just to give you a sense what how does this look like, at uh, step uh, T, uh, we have at the upper row here, no guidance. And at the lower row here, we have guidance calls in mind. And with iteration, after iteration, you could see uh, we are refining our predictions. And here for the unguided one, we are start developing a mode that the car might take, you know, right and not only left. And with guidance, you could see that the modes are collapsing basically into the goal with different speed profiles. Okay, finally, we end up with reasonable prediction for the guidance where uh, we actually end up at the, uh, at the final point we intend to be at, while you know, for the unguided one, we are capturing multimodal distribution of the car either taking right or left. When we test benchmark this, we notice it's produced quite competitive results compared to other multi-agent predictions. Okay. So uh, now the third part of my talk, which is about data. And for the data to for our models to be to be scalable, we need data that is improved in quality and volume. So the first part, the sub part of this data section is going to be about quality by adding sensory input, and the second part, how do we realize um, volume by uh, producing synthetic labels and synthetic trajectories? So for the um, for the sensory part, we realize uh, that a lot of uh, our behavior and planning models performance might be tied to the perception subsystem or stack of machine learning models. So just to remind you, all of our scene encoder inputs rely on a perception stack models that produce these 3D boxes predictions. So if the perception stack cannot figure out tail cases, 
um, and does not handle them very well, we should not expect our behavior and plan on to do very well in these scenarios and therefore propagating the issues and the errors across the system. So the question is, um, it's more of a, a concern on quality, but it's also concern on maintainability. Uh, a lot of our initial push for simplicity of design come from the, the input domain is quite complex. We have four modalities instead of one because they come from different perception machine learning model predictions. So what happens if we move to the world where basically we replace all of these with sensors, okay? So to realize that, we, um, we released a, a new data set, an augmentation of one, uh, way more open data set, where for the run segments that are uh, for behavior prediction, we annotated them with LiDAR cloud points. And the hope that this accelerates the research in the area of end-to-end -end learning and how do we utilize sensory data uh, information directly into behavior and planning. So uh, in summary, we released um, the new data set recently. The paper is on archive. And as you could see, uh, it's the largest one with cloud point, LiDAR cloud points. And if, uh, here is a visualization of what a perception stack will produce in the 3D boxes, the yellow ones. But our, as you could see, our LiDAR cloud point has way higher coverage and way more data. So that represents a challenge in terms of compute. But we are looking you know, for the community you know, to start innovating on top of this. Uh, large data set. To establish a baseline, we took a state-of-art uh, encoder uh, released by Waymo called SW Former, where we basically take a, a point cloud, 3D point cloud, encode them with the SW Former to, uh, to summarize them in, in a set of vectors. We augmented our previous you know, inputs. Now that might be leading to, an, in, in, uh, to more complexity. We are adding an extra modality. This is just to establish a baseline in the hope that later on we actually can replace all of these with the with the cloud uh, cloud the lidar cloud point. So we added the extra modality, and we noticed that it actually improved a lot of the um, uh, domain metrics, which means that it's still even with the you know state of art perception stack model, we still have areas where we could improve our perception stack, or maybe there is always a necessity to look at the sensory data for final you know coverage of tail scenarios. So that has been all about the quality of the data. What about the volume of it? So I want to motivate this section of knowledge distillation by reminding you that all of our model runs in ego frame. What does that mean? For every agent in the scene, we have to run the model uh, again and again. And in urban environments like San Francisco and so on, you could imagine there's plenty of uh, cars, pedestrians, and cyclists around. So if for every prediction, we have to take the scene, rotate it, and center it around the agent we want to predict, then that leads to a lot of uh, repeated kind of um, computation and um, uh, un, un, you know, repeated uh, computation that's unnecessary. So how can we leverage you know, uh, this redundant computation in a better way? So you would imagine the dream is basically is to take the scene ones, Take a neural network and predict uh, the predict the trajectories for all agents simultaneously. Um, unfortunately, if you look at Argoverse, for example, as a benchmark, most of the scene-based uh, models are quite lagging in quality. Actually, none of them reach the top ten uh, spots in the benchmark. So, so we have a huge uh, gap in performance, and the leading models all uh, ego frame based. So. We, we thought, how can we bridge this gap and narrow it? So uh, we looked for knowledge distillation. So knowledge distillation is the, the concept, the framework of thinking where we train a large uh, quality model uh, we call teacher, um, ask it for its prediction in each training example, and ask the student to mimic these uh, predictions. Um, and the student is a smaller model or a different architecture. In this case, these models are not different in, in, in capacity in compute as much as they are Basically, one of them is the egocentric model, where we know it produces the best outcomes. And the student model is basically the scene-centric model, which we know it lags in, in quality. So what we do, we ask the ego model to predict several trajectories and with their probability. We sample them according to their probabilities. And in the paper we presented last year in ECRA, we proposed several sampling strategies. We, once we sample a trajectory, we take one trajectory as the ground truth, and we ask the student not to only predict the ground truth we actually observed in the logs, but also to mimic the teacher prediction. And then this mimicking the teacher prediction, we call the distillation loss. So that, 
that is the general paradigm. And we, when we benchmarked it, we noticed that in general, regardless of sampling strategies, leads a significant improvement on Wandi. Uh, but not only that, um, uh, it also on Argoverse improved the system significantly. Unfortunately, the improvement still did not catch up with um, uh, with the with the agent centric model, but it's making it closer and closer. Just to give you a sense here, we moved from 93 centimeters min EDE to 85, but still the agent centric basically is 81, and the state of art is 79. So there is still plenty of work to be done. Applying it on in house data that's way larger in size, we still see these improvements across board by doing distillation from uh, a scene centric model as a teacher to the ego frame agent based, um, sorry, the teacher being an agent ego frame based model uh, into the student, which is a scene centric. So to summarize, I demonstrate to you that we uh, try to improve our modeling in terms of capacity and architecture, uh, try to improve its output representation to support multi agent and work on improving the data by improving its quality through adding sensory data and its volume with knowledge distillation. And with that, uh, I would like uh, to thank you and uh, see if you guys have any questions. Questions? Any questions? Um, so Rami, uh, with the, uh, um, oh, okay. so I, I just want to quickly ask with the cross attention of, uh, with the different modalities uh, you presented, uh, or how do you, what are sort of like the key pitfalls there to uh, embed the different modalities such that the cross attention sort of, I don't know, if it, does it like work out of the box or is there a lot of fiddling uh, to be done? That makes sense. Um, so I would say um, basically for, for the, the cross attention or the self attention scene encoder, because the Mm -hmm. The cross attention yep. is more of the vanilla one. It's, it's usually the scene encoder where you have the multiple modalities. So a lot of these modalities do not come in the same uh, features. So that's why you have a projection layer just to unify the hidden size. But then you end up with uh, a tensor where it's um, batch size, number of uh, agents or objects, uh, the spatial one or um, social one, then the third dimension is the time, then the hidden size. So the also, these do not come almost always in the same dimension. So what usually happened is that one of one of the easiest strategies is just to flatten everything into 3D. Well, like you can imagine this is just a set of agents at different time steps and let the attention basically do most of the work. So if you are not concerned about uh, latency, usually the simplest recipe worked charmingly well. It's usually when you look at the paper, there was a lot of study just to make sure that these things actually can run in reality. So you, you might see a lot of um, fiddling to guarantee the timing to be okay. But if you are concerned about equality and, and, uh, and good predictions, like if you're developing teacher models and giant models, uh, attention is extremely powerful to do uh, a lot of the heavy lifting, basically. I see. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, hey, thanks for the uh, presentations. Um, I have a question regarding the um... Um, so you know for the uh, agents and planning model. So when you move to new cities, the traffic flow is slightly different across different cities. So meaning, for example, in some cities you can drive like pretty like eight max, you can drive with it, like you can drive like ten miles above for other cities, you drive like you know, you can only drive like three miles above the city. So there's a lot of nuances in the traffic law differences across different cities. So how do you guys handle that in a single model? Do you guys do something like single digital modeling so that you have a, some different embedding for the two cities so that when you mention the single model, how do you handle the credit loans just across different cities? Uh, I struggled here. Can you summarize the question? Well, so the question is how do you no, I cannot hear. Can, can this? Uh, can the yeah. I think the question is if there are any 
uh, or how do you how does it, the model generalize across cities if there's like different you know regulations or different average speeds but in different cities or countries or whatever uh is there any explicit handling of this or is it just you know data so so basically uh what i have been presenting is mainly uh imitation learning so these models are um, you know trying to imitate the distribution of the data so in case if we have multiple geographies and so on you think about it this is a multi-model distribution of outputs so the the model uh is capable of basically just capturing more model um, modalities and different prof uh, driving profiles and we are not only by the way capturing only you know our own profile of driving but also we capturing other agents we observe so this is extremely heterogeneous sets of agents with different so it's not only the change of city the all change we're trying to model a large population um uh, it boils down to be um also adding more emphasis on the capacity of the model so you cannot imagine that the, you know what you capture across countries can be in the same capacity where you do in a small locality so um definitely uh the imitation learning is supposed to capture these now for a planner it's a different thing and you need to adapt the planner to to follow the regulations and the sets of rules for every geography and municipality so um, but that what I'm presenting is just the imitation learning part of it, where we only try to capture the data as we observe distribution and not manipulate it. I think one of the drawbacks on the image learning from image stations is you have to wait for data collections. You need to drive a lot in certain decisions before you can deploy. So if you want to shorten the deployment, so what what would you do to um, speed up the deployment? Um, for the model and the cities, taking into account the differences, nuances across different cities. Uh, can you repeat? Um, it's just yeah, it's not the question. Sorry, um, uh, the, the mic. The problem. Uh, maybe you can just come here, maybe, and quickly because uh, we have. Yeah, time. yeah, just the mic. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think so. So when um, so when so when you do um, learning by imitations. You have to count on collecting a lot of data before you can deploy a new model to new cities. So now, if you want to shorten the deployment, um, so what do you do to the model in order to um, to learn the nuances across different cities faster, even before the data is available or with less data? Um, so to adapt, so just also to realize a lot of what we have been demonstrating is on small benchmark like WOMD, which is you know. Not, not, not as gigantic as industrial data set. So to adapt to, to new cities, I'm, I don't think we necessarily measure the transfer learning between the cities, but you know the, the general paradigm is there is no, like there's not, nothing gonna be better than just more data. So um, I'm, again, I, I come personally from the NLP domain, so it's cheaper to collect data than the to invent methods, uh, even if they were, you know, need to be, cons you know, drive cars around. So. That would be my judgment. I, I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. What do you think about the importance of scene consistent and ego condi condition predictions? Do you think it's required or just a waste of resources? So, so um, uh, I think this is a hotly debated question. Can we actually achieve the same equality of prediction from top-down view of the scene versus like having different views of every agent? Um, uh, so far, as I mentioned, all of the leading methodologies and models are big, basically eco frame and running per, per agent. Uh, I don't see a reason why we could not achieve the scene frame uh, understanding where we can reason about all agent without having the redundant encoding of the scene. So did we demonstrate it yet? Absolutely not. But you know, as a human, you could look at all the scene and you can reason about all the agents without really necessarily rerunning the model again and again. So uh, also you have to realize that if there is a hundred agents you want to model, you are running the inference a hundred times. The question is, given a hundred times inference, could you have achieved the same thing with a scene? Uh, or even less if you want to be more optimal. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I think we can do without it. Um, I we still didn't. I don't think. I did not see any evidence of it so far. But uh, it's also not 
as um, popular area as I would like it to be. So like in the sense, I think we should do more research in that, you know, given, you know, if you want to drive in a city like San Francisco where there's 200 people walking, just unrealistic to try to model everyone. Okay, yeah, thanks. I kind of agree. I think that's not really required. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Rami, and also all of the other speakers. Um, I uh, will have now a little bit of a informal discussion slash social, and then we move down to uh, the the posters. Um, so you, uh, they changed the poster number, so I'm just going to put them up here on a slide or something during the break, so you can uh, know where to put up the posters. So thanks again to all the speakers. <laughs>